Welcome, everyone. Today is Thursday, March 30th. Um, of the, this is the Arlington School Committee. Uh, this is my last meeting that I'll be chairing, so it's bittersweet <laughs> uh, for me. Um, let me just talk a little bit about some of the artwork that's in um, the room, and then I want to introduce a very exciting group of students that we have here today. Um, so starting over here, we have um, kindergartners. So this is... Um, Thompson and Stratton schools, um, and this is the kindergartners were shown examples of landscape painting, observed lines and line variations. Students then created their own landscape drawings using straight, bumpy, zigzag, and other lines of their choice. These drawings were completed using oil pastels, and students were encouraged to experiment with blending colors. Very cool. Moving over here, uh, fourth grade, no tan. Fourth grade students explored the Japanese design concept of no tan in these collages. No tan is translated as light dark and is used to refer to the balance and interaction of light and dark in a composition or design. To make these designs, students all started with a square of paper. As they cut out shapes and placed them outside the square and created larger symmetrical shapes where one side is white and the other side is black. Very cool. Um, right over here, um, I think I love these colors here, is gadget prints. Second grade students were introduced to printmaking tools and then mixed tints and shades of the cool color family to create these experimental designs. They first mixed black with blue, green, and violet to create shades of these colors. These colors were applied to the background using a brayer. Next, students mixed white with these colors to create lighter tints. Students then completed their designs by printing using found objects. And moving over to here, um, we have fifth grade relief prints. Fifth grade students explored mark making and positive and negative space in these relief prints, which were inspired by nature. Students experimented with impressing a variety of marks in a thin styrofoam sheet in order to create visual texture. Since the final prints only used one color ink, students had to think about how to convey their ideas using only line and shape. And back here, very cool looking monsters, as you can see. Um, first grade students read the book Bye Bye Big Bad Bully Bug. I know, it's adorable. By Ed Emberley. Ed Emberley is an award-winning writer and illustrator of over 100 children's books. This book was a perfect jumping off point for students to explore color, mixing, symmetry, and collage as they created their own monsters. Very, very cool. Yes, and next we want to get to the exciting uh, thing, exciting for us, I think. Um, right in our room today, we have the entire I think, hockey team that um, Spy Ponders, who just um, uh, skated their way to victory. And I, I wasn't at the game. Uh, actually, Paul is at the game. He's going to tell about it. But from everything I've heard, it was incredibly exciting and that you guys performed just admirably with great teammanship, um, you know, really coming together as a team to support each other, um, really good sports. And I just heard so many positive things about you, not only as athletes, but as individuals and you know, community members, and that, that's just a really great thing to hear. So I'm really excited. So Paul's going to talk about the game that he saw. Um, go ahead. I mean, how cool is this? I mean, the anxiety of going into overtime and then pulling it off with 15 seconds into overtime and turning anxiety into instant joy. I mean, uh, we were down by that end of the, uh, the rink, so we were able to see exactly what happened with that final goal. It was a thing of beauty. But it was pretty obvious that those guys uh, from uh, Central Catholic were big and they were hitting you really hard. And it didn't really matter because you just kept going at them and you kept getting up and you kept making smart plays and you kept working as a team. And, and, and you just maintain your momentum and, and, and did what it took to, to bring a victory back for you. And, and it goes noticed that First of all, this is only the third public school to win the Super 8. Uh, it's incredibly difficult to beat teams that are able to recruit players. And that uh, we have a group, core group of seniors who stayed with Arlington High and played hockey at Arlington High. And that shows another uh, a real love for the town, love for your school, and, and, and a real commitment to each other as a team. And it's that team commitment that obviously was the thing that made it happen. And I congratulate you and your coach for, for uh, building that camaraderie and team. It was a lot of fun being down at the, the, the garden that Sunday night. And, uh, you know, I hope 
this is something you'll have all your life is, is, is a tremendous achievement and something really fun and important that you did. And know that you can keep on doing great things no matter what you choose to do. Thanks. So, uh, Coach Missouri is going to come up and introduce the players, and we have a special. He wants to say a few words. Oh, say a few words, please. Come. And we have a gift for you as well. <coughs> well, it was an exciting night. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it was a great night for the community, great night for our team, um, great night for Arlington Athletics and Arlington High School. Um, one of the things that people probably don't realize is, you know, it's great being the coach, but you need such a support system around you. And we appreciate everything the school committee's done for athletics over the years. Um, Dr. Bodie's been great. I think this is our third championship together back in Winchester. When she was on school committee, we <laughs> won a couple back then, and I was yeah. the Winchester coach. Um, we had great support from our principal, our athletic director throughout. So, you know, one thing as a coach is you want to just be given the tools to be able to perform and do your job. And, you know, the support system is outstanding, and we appreciate that very much. So, so thank you very much. Um, I'm going to go ahead and introduce the team one at a time. They go up, get their hats. I'll introduce Can I beg this. your, uh, Dr. Brody would want to say I, a couple words as well. Well, I also want to say that um, it requires great leadership, and I want to thank you for the leadership and the mentoring that you've done for all of our students. It's been, an, you've done an excellent job, and we're very proud of all of our students. I think one of the things I was really proud about at the game, besides the fact it was so exciting and you won, when, when at the very beginning of the game, you stood as a team while they were calling out names and you went up together. I mean, that's, that, that symbolic gesture said so much to me about, about how you feel about each other. So you've learned a lot of lessons and these are all huge, great life lessons and you've had a great role model. Um, and I hope that um, we continue to have such success. And thank you for your, for your work with thank us. Thank you, thank you very much. All right, we'll introduce, um, I'll introduce, I'll mention a little bit how great our school system is by bragging about where the seniors are going to school when they introduce oh, them. please do that. <laughs> um, Shane Halian, Shane, you go up and get your hat, he's going to Wentworth. Um, Sean Tomaszewski is going to St. Anselm's. Peter Sheshrig is going to Phillips Exeter Academy. Michael Mazzi is in at Providence, is currently under contract negotiations with them. <laughs> um, Michael Curran has many options and just hasn't made a decision yet. <laughs> Kevin Ouellette is going to Phillips Andover. Johnny Piggott is uh, going to Tilton Academy. Uh, and Jeffrey McDonald is going to Deerfield Academy. So you can see that our school system, along with our athletics, was really very good with this class. Yeah, slow down. She's running, <laughs> falling behind on the hats. That's great. They, you know what? They can just grab it. It's adjustable. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they'll, they'll figure it out. Um, then we had a junior, Michael Callahan, junior, John Massey, junior, and our goalie, Jack Pernod, junior, Anthony Santaswasso, sophomore, Max Perkel, sophomore, Mark DeCourcy, sophomore, Joe Sheshirig, sophomore, Joel Hanley, sophomore, Dara Keneally, sophomore, Cameron Ryan, Sophomore, A.J. Leosa. Freshman, Tyler Callahan. Freshman, Ryan Davies. Freshman, Brendan Piggott. Freshman, Brendan Jones. Freshman, Anthony Missouri. Freshman, Andrew Malatesta. Um, assistant coach and gla graduate of the class of 83 and one of our all-time great players, Scott Jones. And then last but not least, um, I don't even know to call him our trainer or our equipment manager, but Johnny Fredericks has been part of the Arlington High program since 1978. He has been here every year continually since 1978. So last but not least, Johnny Fredericks. So that was, that's our team, a couple of guys are missing. 
And we'll take those. Well, we'll, other, yes, yeah, we we'll have take a, the other hats with there's us. There's a hat for all of the volunteers that have yep. helped you helped your program. We'll grab them all. Good. So we still have some exciting events. Thank you. We still got to go to the state house for a day. Nice. Oh, great. We got a float for the parade. And the Red Sox just invited us to uh, join them at home plate to be on it on May 2nd. All right. It's all good. <laughs> well, uh, wear your hats. Yeah, we'll wear, wear our hats, hats to the Red Sox game. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Wear the swag. All right. Thank you. Congrats. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Congratulations. <laughs> what? Is there a picture? Yeah, yeah. All right, so we get a, a picture? We, we're going to get a picture, right, of the, everybody? I've, I've already taken quite a few. Yeah? I have to back up and get the yeah, whole we, we can come, yeah, you want to stand hats. up? Would this be better? Yeah, why don't you guys stand up and then. I have to. Oh, okay. okay. All right. You want to stand up? Stand up. All right. Stand up, guys. Would you mind standing up for the picture? With the hats. Great. Awesome. Come on, coaches. Yeah, and the coach, yes. Yeah, that coach. Uh, the, oh, they were better sit. And the people in front. People in front could sit. iPhone? Yeah, that's it. Yeah, I think that works better. Smile, pretend you're happy. They're happy. <laughs> <laughs> they were happy or at the garden. They are happy. <laughs> they're, still, they're still glowing. <laughs> I'll sit. Can you see the kids in the back? Yeah. Yeah, I can see all other faces. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Right. Yeah. I think we're all done. <laughs> oh, wait, wait. Paul, it's got to get one more. All time, that perfect. <laughs> Paul, you just blew out the other one. <sighs> Thank you so much. I, I, we really appreciate your coming here tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Classic. Yeah. Shaking the soup yeah. again. <laughs> well, nice to meet you, Peter. You've been a great leader. <laughs> well deserved win. Thank you. And good luck with the, uh, yeah, it's going to be fun with all the other events. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, Joel. have to turn TV huh. on May 2nd. And we'll see all your white hats there. <laughs> well, but you guys must have thought I was I know, it's supposed to be a surprise. What's happening? Wait, May 2nd? Good. None of it got forwarded. Good. Thanks, Peter. Congratulations. Congrats. Hmm? He's coming. He's here. Okay, well. He'll, he'll be here shortly. Yeah. So we have three or four people. You guys can right. wherever you want. Um, hey, so the, oh, the, next, the next item is public participation. Do we? Yes. Okay, great. We're glad that they went first. <laughs> <laughs> they might have stolen some of your thunder. I don't know. <laughs> Now the exciting part. Yes, exactly. Are you, you bring us a champion? Speaking as a group? Uh, well, yeah, actually individually. Individually, okay. okay. Oh, so you want three minutes each, you're saying. <laughs> Hi, my name is Shelly Chabra. I um, am a resident of Arlington since 2010. I have a nine-year-old and a three-year-old currently in the system. Um, I am speaking just as a first-time participant, um, attended the Vision 2020 education meeting, and wanted to show... Um, the effectiveness of that meeting for a first time participant because there's a lot to learn or a lot to, I guess, dig into to become a more aware and educated resident, especially with younger children in the public school system. So I want to be an effective um, contributor. So as my first time, I thought that the layout and the format of the meeting was actually kind of brilliant. Um, I've never been to a meeting like that where we enter and we get a list of sort of subject matters where we can choose the ones that resonate with us the most and then go to that table and speak directly to a teacher and kind of get the knowledge dump of what's on their mind and what they're innovating in the classroom. Um, so just that mixture of sitting at a table with parents of all different age groups um, and um, kind of feeding off the energy of the teacher directly. It was just a really great first time experience for me. Um, what was especially great was just the teacher for local government or government studies at the high school, which was very excited to see what she was doing and actually wish that that happened at elementary and middle school level. So, um, so that was you know, my reflection. I'm really interested in seeing more of this happen. Um, that meeting could have been longer, easily been longer. I would have stayed and learned more. and. Um, you know, maybe even have 
a weekend event like that so that more parents could attend because I think there is an eagerness especially from younger parents to get um, more visibility and more um, sort of direct relatedness to the system that's all I have to say great thank you thank you Hi, good evening. I'm uh, Bill Fischelis, and I am a, uh, a parent um, of a fifth grader at Pierce and an eighth grader at the Odyssey. And uh, I'm also very pleased to be here tonight to talk about uh, the Innovations in Curriculum Night. Uh, that first of all, I'd like to give uh, some credit to Dr. Chisson and the teachers who helped put it together, that it really was uh, a fantastic evening, and I know a lot of effort went into that. Uh, so thank you very much. And uh, I agree with everything that uh, Shelley just said, that uh, of course uh, there could have been more parents there, uh, but there was a fairly good showing. Uh, I would love to see more things like that happening, that it was a, a great opportunity to see some of the uh, innovation that's happening in the district at all levels. And that was also a wonderful thing about having um, uh, all levels there as well, and not just focus on the high school or not just focus middle school or elementary school. So I applaud that as well. Um, and again, I would love to see some more of those things happening uh, and a lot more opportunity uh, for, uh, for parents to see what's going on. So thank you. Thanks, Bill. So Scott Lever, I have uh, two kids at Bishop, and uh, I also wanted to say thank you to, to Dr. Chesson in particular for organizing and to the curriculum leaders and the other teachers and administrators who participated. It was a great evening and as a sort of co-participant and co-organizer with Vision 2020, I think the feedback was very consistently strong and, and positive from the parents and we're hoping that we'll be able to do this event again um, <clears throat> with you. Um, so it, it really represented the school and everything that you're doing very well. Um, I had the chance to attend three sessions, and each one of them was great. I took specific things away from each of the three. So I had a chance to sit with the uh, computer science uh, leader f from the high school, Dan, uh, in one session. And I was um, really impressed with how that program has grown in the, in the last few years and the really innovative and interesting things that they've added to that curriculum. So taking it far beyond a very basic computer science class. Um, <clears throat> so that's very encouraging, and it was also encouraging to hear that Dan's, the demand for Dan's, Dan's courses outstrips the capacity. Um, so that was really fantastic to hear, and <clears throat> he's a real treasure. Um, I also had a chance to sit with the sixth grade social studies teacher uh, from, uh, from, from the Audison and learn a little bit about the way that she's personalized the classroom, and, and that was fantastic, absolutely fantastic. And, and, absolutely consistent with the things that we've talked about in Vision 2020. I also had a chance to sit with the math curriculum leader, and <clears throat> the thing I took away from that one was I'm gonna have a lot of catch-up work to do <laughs> um, because of the changes in the math curriculum uh, since I went to school. So, uh, and, and that's a great challenge, so I, I have a book on order for that. So uh, overall, it was a great night, and we, I think, all wanted to say thank you for doing that and taking the time. We know that the teachers took personal time and, and put a lot of energy into it and it really showed. Um, a couple other quick points um, <clears throat> uh, regarding Vision 2020. So there are a couple of follow-up items that are on our agenda and I think it would be helpful if we could maybe talk about a more uh, fuller debriefing with you. Um, we have uh, made some progress on, on the principles and qualities of what it means to be educated in the community. And we'd like to share that with both the school committee and the school administration and get your feedback and, and your insight on that. And we also would like to simultaneously reach out to the community and get more input and more support for those ideas uh, as well. So, so to get a broader base of support for that. The other thing which I want to mention is Dr. Chesson has been generous to, um, to agree to do a session in June. And we're still deciding a date, June 6th or the 13th for a special focus on the, the potential curriculum at Gibbs. Um, so we know that's a work in progress, but it'll be a great chance to have an early conversation about the direction that's heading in. So, thank you. Great, thank you very much.
So our next item on the agenda, um, we'd like to introduce um, the candidate for the chief financial officer. Um, yeah, please come to the table. The, um, so there's a microphone there, and so just when you answer, just speak into the mic. Um, so let me talk about the structure of what we should what we're do. Um, I want um, Dr. Bodhi and Dr. Alison Ampe to talk a little bit about the process um, of that the the um, committee that was making the selection, what they went through. And, um, and then we're just going to go around and have each school committee member um, ask questions. Um, great. So, uh, Dr. Brody? Okay. Um, we, we posted the position, and uh, soon after that, we put together a, a search committee, which I think it's important to to mention at least the position titles of the people that were on the committee because it was a large committee and representing um, a, a lot of the people that the, the CFO would be interacting with on a regular basis. Uh, in, in addition to myself uh, as superintendent, we had Dr. Allison Ampey as representing the school committee. We had the controller for the town, the deputy town manager, the chair of the finance committee, payroll manager, our director of HR, the director of special education, uh, the district's director of grants in Title I, a consultant to the business office who is a former CFO herself, the director of technology for town and schools, and the director of facilities for town and schools. So it's a fairly a large group representing all of some of the key functions uh, that make this both town and school work so well. Um, we, we received a number of applications, and one of the things that I don't think that some people understand properly from the business world is that we uh, are required to have, uh, a candidate is required to have certification through the Department of Education. So basically, there became two, two groups of candidates, those that did have certification and those that did not. Um, and we were only went forward with those that were. There was also some pre-reference checking. And um, we were ready to interview four candidates right just about the time we were uh, beginning the interviews. Uh, one of the candidates notified us that he had accepted another position. So we had three candidates, all of which were very uh, skilled, um, terrific backgrounds, uh, I think presented very well to the committee. And uh, Dr. Allison Ampey can talk a little bit more about that too and, and, and the process. But, you know, we were very fortunate to have some very good candidates. And um, tonight uh, we're you know, presenting Mr. Denisio as, um, as, uh, as a recommendation for this position. Yeah. So I don't want to say too much because I'm a little bit confused about what I can say and what I can't say to preserve confidentiality, but it was, it was a large group. It was very congenial. We had a list of questions that we went through for each candidate. I thought they were going to be here, but I don't they, see them. They are. Um, oh, they're in front of but oh. we, we, have we would go questions. round Robin style and each candidate was asked the same questions. Um, and I think the questions were good ones. There were certain ones which made it really clear which directions that we wanted to go. Um, and I'm not sure what else I can say without. Um, Just, I guess, yeah. a little bit about the process. So when did you guys start the process and when? We can let uh, Mr. S Mr. Spiegel speak to oh, that. Oh, just approximately. Since <laughs> Sorry. This was posted uh, a couple months ago on School Spring, and I can actually tell you um, the exact day in a minute. Um, so, it, you know, in a, a couple months' time, you know, when um, Ms. Johnson um, had uh, announced that she was leaving, soon after that, we uh, we moved to uh, to post it. It was actually posted on School Spring on January twentieth. Okay. So, you know, it's been a couple months since it was posted and taking time to get applications in and then um, figure out how to put the committee together and go through the candidates and decide who to bring in for interviews and schedule that. So, so actually, just a question. Was everybody able to meet with all the top candidates or is that because it's such a large group? That's yes. great. Yeah. Yes. Um, 
And then there was a vote taken, I assume, right? Is that In addition to that, um, Dr. Allison, um, Ampi also went through all of the, app, read all the applications mm -hmm. as we did as well. So she saw all of the candidates who had applied for the position. Yeah, I read both stacks and actually found one that was in the not qualified and belonged in the qualified, so pushed that one through and, and stuff, so. Okay, yeah. thanks. Okay, so I'm gonna actually just, uh, we're gonna go down the row and I'm gonna actually start with um, Mr. Cardin. Oh, first. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Uh, okay, so um, one of the in? things that I'm interested in. Oh, in we did. I'm sorry. I, 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 I just realized that we actually, we had intended for you to make a statement first before we do questions. Oh. That's okay. I, I, time I, to think. I just, I just, for, so now you have time to think. So, sorry. Uh, <laughs> um, would, you, would you mind just telling us a little bit about um, your background, <clears throat> what attracted you to Arlington, um, you know, what you, are excited about the position, stuff like sure. that. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, so uh, currently, I'm in. I, I work in Winchester as the uh, director of finance for the Winchester Public Schools. Uh, similar role. And, and before that, I was doing the same in uh, Salem, and that was my first job on this on the uh, school side of municipal. Before that, I had worked in Woburn as the um, uh, deputy auditor, budget manager for the city of Woburn. And while I was doing that, uh, I worked on a bunch of projects with the school business manager or assistant, assistant superintendent of finance in, in Woburn. And short, in, in short order, I realized that that was the place to be if you were going to work in, in municipal. Um, you know, that's where all the exciting stuff was happening. So I, I then got certified and, and, and went over uh, and then st started looking for a school business manager job. Uh, so that's what attracted me to this field. Uh, what attracted me to Arlington was uh, when I saw the job posted, uh, I remember uh, Tony Mertz, who's here now helping, helping you guys out, uh, had told me when this comes up, you should look at it. Uh, I think it'd be a good match and it's a, it's a, it's a good spot. So, uh, <coughs> you know, that piqued my interest. I looked at it a little bit and I thought, geez, it's a, you know, it's a little bigger. It's got more buildings. It's, you know, more kids, a bigger budget. It's, it's clo nice and close to home. I, I just live a couple towns away. Uh, so that's that's really what piqued my interest. And as I dug a little deeper and, and talked to some more people and did some more research, I saw what an exciting time it is for the Arlington Public Schools with with uh, everything going on and the the enrollment growth, um, the amazing enrollment growth you've had, and and the ongoing uh, planned and potential building projects that are coming up. Uh, you know, it has the budget complexities that that we every town seems to have, but. Uh, uh, that's, that's what's the exciting stuff. And as I went through the, the, that's what got me to go to, to think about Arlington. And as I went through the process, you know, it really, it really was clear that Arlington was the place to be for me. It matched my skill set, I think, perfectly uh, with having worked on complex budgets and cash strapped places and, and, and uh, extensive work and building projects that that's really what solidified it for Arlington for me. Thanks. Okay, now Mr. Carton. <laughs> Great. All right, so uh, my background, um, before I, I went back to law school, I was a management and budget analyst uh, for the federal government. So part of what I w had to do and, and what I think is partly missing from what we've done in, in Arlington is, is sort of analyze trends and data. And we, we have lots of data about, you know, fortunately one, one of the strengths of our prior CFO was generating lots of, of data uh, about the budget in, in, in more detail than, than a lot of communities provide. But what was missing was sort of an, an analysis of the data and, 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 you know, where we're spending and why and how we compare to other towns and things like that. So that's something that I'm interested in doing more of, and I was wondering if that's something you've done in the past or something you feel qualified uh, to do or having your, your staff do. It's not necessarily something the CFO needs to be bogged down with, but something that the CFO should direct. Sure. So, so um, uh, a little bit, not, not, um, not a lot of, of experience doing that, but certainly the, the, you know, it's in the skill set. Uh, I think the important thing when you do that and, and when we have done a little bit of that in the places I've been was more of the, uh, we're, we spend this much more 
on this category really why and you know maybe it's appropriate and maybe it isn't and sometimes when something catches your eye like that and why you know for instance where I am um, with busing you, you would think it's it shouldn't be as expensive as it is uh, small as it is but you know when you when you look at it and you in it catches your eye and then you dig down a little deeper and understand why that's the case it, you feel more comfortable that okay we're spending in these areas but it's, and I think it's important to compare to other places, but to really compare to yourself. Do we really need to be doing this? Sometimes there is a good reason why we spend more than somebody else on something. Um, so not a, not a uh, ton of experience doing it, but a little bit and feel comfortable that we do it. Dr. Allison, um, yeah. I wonder if you could tell people about your approach to budgeting. Sure. Zero big. Sure. Uh, so I, my approach is always well. At, well, after you we find out what the approach of the committee and the superintendent is, but um, rough to me, I like to start as close to zero base as possible. Especially, especially someone coming new into a position is very helpful for that person to to get to know the who's and why's of of each of the budget lines. Um, I think it's important for to go through the exercise for for everybody to to see really in detail what you're spending and, and the why, just, just like we just talked about. Um, oftentimes y you, you start with all intentions of doing that and you, you stray a little bit, which you know, on the personnel side might be okay, but on the expense side, maybe you wanna stay the, stay the course a little bit. Uh, so it's, it's getting the, so my approach is to stay the course as much as you can, but be able to work with everybody um, to make sure the process is moving forward and we're, we're getting the information we need and that it's the information that the committee wants, superintendent wants, that we, that's best for everybody, that's the shooter makers. Mr. Sleepin. Uh It's good to meet you. Um, uh, I know that w Winchester is just completing their high school project. Uh, we're entering the feasibility study right now. Uh, could you tell us what you think we have to look forward to in the process of uh, rebuilding this building, uh, what your role in this would likely be vis-a-vis -vis your experience in Winchester and maybe what a timeline to completion might be. Sure. So uh, what you have look, to look forward to is, is um, you know, the, the, the fun part of feasibility is, which you will probably have the same problem we had, is where do you put it? <laughs> Where do you put the building? Mm -hmm. And you'll probably do what we did and look at a lot of places and realize it's got to go where it is and how, how can we do that? And that typically comes with a phased occupied renovation, which uh, sounds as complicated as it is. Mm -hmm. And um, I think what I could bring in, in, uh, to the table for that is having been through it, the lessons learned and what to think of ahead of time um, and just uh, how to, you know, when we should be thinking of uh, logistical things or, you know, um, swing space items, I, I think. Um, I think I could help in that area. Um, timeline, looking at the, I think you have four separate buildings here. And uh, if you, if it was phased, occupied, reno with, I'm sure, in addition, um, you, I think you'd probably be looking at four phases to it. Uh, or maybe five, so that could be six years, maybe. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Ms. Starks? Uh, no questions. Mr. Hayner? Could you tell us uh, your background and uh, plans for Munis? So I'm, I'm glad someone asked that question. <laughs> uh, so I've got to talk about Munis a lot in my uh, few hours I've spent here, so uh, I like that. I have uh, extensive background in Munis um, since w they used it in each of the um, three places I, wor I worked. And uh, for, for me, um, one of the benefits that I have is from working on both sides, on you know the city side and on the school side, um, to being able to be more involved in, in setup and rights and privileges on the city side and uh, you know building account structure and, and, and things like that and then on the school side 
with reporting. I, I do a lot of, of professional development or, or training of our clerical staff and uh, principals and directors on how to produce reports, uh, the reports that they need. Um, you know, so, and they're all different. Some may have, some may want a detailed report that has all the info in it. Some may want a snapshot. Some may just want account by account with a bottom line. Um, and they're all pretty easy to do at when you know how you do, how to do it. Uh, so I think with Munis, we talked a little bit here about uh, some of the possible changes to make here with uh, encumbering payroll, with it being such a large part of every school budget that that's I think necessary to make sure you're encumbering payroll. That's a process I've been through twice. Uh, from you know we, we do it now, but from start to finish, um, I think I could really help with that. May I follow up? With that? Um, Just real quick. Well, we're going to do another round. Actually. Okay, fine. Okay, Mr. Thielen. <coughs> Mr. Yeah. So uh, thanks very much <coughs> and uh, welcome. Uh, my my question is: We had a, a, a our CFO, our previous CFO, did a great job. One issue she brought up uh, was the uh, number of uh, meetings <coughs> with town uh, committees, town bodies, and, and that sort of thing. I just want to <coughs> see if you've given some thought to that, if that works within your, your I, schedule. I <coughs> appreciate the question, and uh, I think the superintendent and I had a long conversation about that and was made very clear the expectations of this position, and I'm well aware of that. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you. Um, actually, sort of related. Um, so the CFO position is a unique position because you have to manage a lot of different relationships, right? So there's these cross relationships with town officials and um, town staff. Um, you're managing up with, you know, you're managing down. So if you can just talk a little bit about your management style. Sure. So I, I think um, another unique opportunity I had in, in all three places I went, there was a strained relationship <laughs> um, between at least one department uh, and the department I went to work for. Um, so um, being able to, to help establish, rebuild, or uh, maintain relationships, I think is a, is a pretty good strength of mine. Um, working my, for my management style, I think it's, you know, can be summed up in one word, collaborative. I'm, you know, I, always want to hear from as many people as possible. I think that's the only way to make the right decisions and, and in the end do what's right for kids, which is what we all want to do. Uh, I think I'm very easily and approachable. Um, you know, I, I think I'll, uh, you know, if I keep going, it'll sound like the buzzwords that you just <laughs> read off the card. So. They have meaning, but I know <laughs> they get overused. <laughs> All right, we're going to do another round. You don't have to ask another question, but we're just going to start. Mr. Cardin? Sure. I, I guess um, as far as career progression, this, this position, while it's a different community, a slightly larger community, it's not a whole lot different from your, your current position. So I guess I'm wondering where you see yourself going. Do you, do you envision you know, trying to get more educational experience and becoming more of a general assistant superintendent, or is your heart set on... on Staying the numbers guy. What 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 what, are you, what sort of drives this your your long-term plans? I think the this position uh, fits my skill set, uh, and this really what I like to do. I think I think um, coming here will allow to to maybe be more uh, strategic in the approach and, and a little bit uh, less hands-on um, um, to some degree. Uh, just with it being a larger district, you can't just have one person doing all that. Um, I, you know, I see myself being in this position, you know, for the long term, being a business manager, CFO, that sort of thing. I don't have any aspirations for have, being a superintendent. I haven't worked, worked for five of them. I see how hard their job is. <laughs> Great. Thanks. Good. Thanks. Dr. Allison, I wonder if you could talk about your approach to um, budgeting for special education. For special ed? Bless you. <coughs> um, yeah, so I... I I, I think I talked about this in our interview about how special ed budgeting process never ends, uh, you know, from from preparing, presenting, and then the hard part, maintaining. Um, it's you, you know, it's a it's a 18 month cycle we we talk about uh, okay. or 18 month marathon. I think it's the most volatile, obviously, for for um, of budget lines. But I think our approach is to be as conservative as you can. Um, when you're predicting expenses and staffing and, and especially with out of district 
uh, placements and transportation um, to be as conservative as you can, but you still have to be uh, realistic and know that there's not an endless supply of, of resources. Um, and I, I think it works well to, we, I spend a lot of time with the special ed director uh, and, her, and her staff uh, getting into um, uh, staffing about caseloads and, and, and TAs and probably more than they'd like me to get involved and who's attached to an IEP and why. And, um, but it's, it's mostly just to make sure that we're, <coughs> we're um, not missing anything and, and we're going to have a, the, the fewest amount of things prop, crop up on us throughout the year. Thank you. Mr. Sleepman. I noticed in your resume and application you were talking about your skill set in terms of managing the SIS. You're uh, an Aspen guy, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and you're talking about Munis. Um, and one of the issues that we have in town is sort of the integration of, uh, of, of the finance operations on the town side and the school side. And so there are all these natural barriers to information which tend to uh, crop up. Um, how do you envision sort of putting all this together, uh, at least on our side of the street, in terms of having an integrated relationship between uh, RSIS and uh, Munis and townside stuff and the other things we need to do? So I. I I think that the, the townside munis and school side munis, um, it's critical for them to be integrated for everybody to, you know, to have, have confidence in their, in their reports they're getting are accurate, um, you know, coming from one place and, and having the townside be able to uh, have access and not have to ask and, and be able to keep an eye, you know, see what's reporting that they need. Um, as, as far as SIS for, um, for staffing uh, mm -hmm. with with Munis, I haven't had um, integrated staffing from from SIS to Munis uh, in any of the districts I've been in. Mm -hmm. uh, I've mostly mostly been, you know, Munis to Excel, Excel to Munis. Mm -hmm. um, I think works well, and uh, we have had I've had a little bit of experience with time and attendance mm -hmm. um, integration. Mm -hmm. uh, not not great experience, but but some experience. Um, so I, I think more crucial munis to munis, town and, and school, mm -hmm. and have experience with that. Not so much on the SIS to munis side, mm -hmm. but I think can be done. I'm just not mm -hmm. sure how crucial that is. So ha wh which platform are you doing your state reporting in Winchester? So we so state reporting for on the sim stuff is is from Aspen. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. Ms. Starks. All set. Okay. Mr. Mm -hmm. um, Hainer. How would you feel about teaching a school committee member about Munis? <laughs> Anytime. <laughs> Thank you. Mr. Thielman. I think all my questions have been answered. And I just want to emphasize, um, which uh, I think uh, Mr. Cardenden um, is that. In the next few years, it is going to be really important that we tell a story about our budget. You know, budgets really reflect our values. They also reflect our constraints, our limitations, you know, what we can and can't do. Um, and I think we've done a better job in the last few years of getting that story across. Um, but I think that's going to be even more crucial in the next few years sort of, to tell that story. So that's more of a statement. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, I agree. Good. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Yeah, uh, Mr. Thon. So I move that we um, select John, John Denisio as did I pronounce it right, John? Yes, John Denisio right as our chief financial officer, and that we um, enter into negotiations, negotiations. Negotiations. contract, contract uh, negotiations, contract negotiations uh, later after the uh, and close of the regular business tonight, or. Like, well, we enter negotiations. Enter negotiations. Well, actually, the question is, we authorize, we are part of we authorize the superintendent, superintendent to enter into negotiations. Yeah. Very good. Yeah, I'll perfect. second that motion. Right. Yeah. Thank you for mm -hmm. the language. Okay. <coughs> and I don't think we have to specify time. Uh, Mr. Schlickman. I'm very pleased to support this uh, uh, nomination. Uh, obviously, when you have a candidate coming from a neighboring community, 
uh, you get a lot of information about a candidate. Mm -hmm. And everything that I've heard about Mr. Denisio is uh, of a very highly competent administrator who develops good personal relationships with, with other folks uh, uh, in town and within the school department. Um, his answer to the night meeting question was, it was uh, music to our ears and sort of, uh, indicates an understanding of the kind of community we are and, uh, and a willingness to play in a community that thrives on citizen uh, involvement. Uh, I envision him having a long and successful career with us. Mr. Hainer. Uh, I support you and I really appreciate uh, what you've done and what we're hoping you're going to do and looking forward to working with you. But I would like to go on record that the negotiations is uh, not just an approval part of the school committee, it's an active part of the school committee. So I think I, I would feel more comfortable in bifurcating this and going forward with the nomination and for potentially further discussion on the negotiations. So I offer that as an I'm, amendment. I offer I'm that actually, as an amendment. I'm unclear about, can you just spell out what you? What I'm asking is to separate this two parts of this motion one is to uh, nominate for approval. Right. For yeah. approval. Mm -hmm. The second part is to enter into negotiations. I'd, I'd ask the committee, I'd, uh, as an amendment, to separate the two and two vote. Okay. Two, so, two motions, if you would. Okay, so there's a motion on the table, but we're going to consider that so one I can, as well. I can reword it. We want me to do that? Would that be easier? So well, fine. No. You can withdraw it and just reword um, it. But I, actually, I'm, I'm, I'm unclear because what happened? To approve it but not to go into negotiations no, would be no. weird. The, I, I, I want to discuss the process of negotiation. I'm, I support the nomination. I support the hiring. I support the concept of negotiations. But the process right now is just the superintendent. Oh. That's my issue. So I want to discuss that part of it. That's all. Okay. Um, um, so do you so want to withdraw your motion? Do you want to redo it? Um, uh, that that's fine. I mean, what Paul, do you want? What do you? Well, no. Here's the question. The, the, would, would you reread the motion, please? Oh, that I have. <laughs> it proves that the school committee accepts the recommendation of John as the CFO and authorizes the superintendent to enter negotiations. Right. Okay. okay. Yeah. I I I, find, I I yeah. I, I if I may, I find that limiting. That's all. Well. Okay. Okay. I, I, okay. I think I understand why you're finding it limiting in that the agency is actually in charge of the negotiations because it's our position. Yes. Would be the, okay. The so we can committee. right. So there was actually some discussion. I mean, we can authorize someone on, myself. And, and on we can say authorize. I mean, the thing is, is that. Uh, Welcome to. We're collegial, but uh, we do. Uh, <laughs> so I so, suggest we just accept. Go for the nomination. And then can, and, and get the guy off the hook yeah. for that part of it, and, and we can talk. About and then we can talk. So I'm going to withdraw okay. the motion. I, I, so I'm going to move that we um, uh, uh, withdraw the motion. I'm going to move that we um, uh, hire John Denisio as our chief financial officer. That we support Sub the rec subject, we support subject to successful negotiations. We support the recommendation. Yes, and I will second that. Um, okay. I will second that. I'll, I'll write it okay. later. Okay, uh, to approve the hire subject to successful negotiations. Yeah, approve yes. the hire subject to successful negotiations. And put his name in it. <laughs> okay. I'll second that. Okay. Okay. No, go to vote first. Okay, so, um, so let's, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, so that's unanimous. Okay, so now we have, need a second motion, right? No, I think that we're, we're subject to negotiations. Subject to negotiations. We can, we can discuss that. Okay, I misunderstood. I misunderstood. And, uh, exactly. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Okay, I misunderstood the, the constraint. Okay. Yes. Great. Thank you. <laughs> because uh, obviously, if we're Thank going you. to negotiations um, with the candidate, we don't want to discuss. I just, I, the I'd like to ask one more question. Any second thoughts after what you've just heard? <laughs> <laughs> no, no. We're, we're a good group. We just. We like to talk. We like to talk. I mean, you got to be out of his vote, so life is good. <laughs> Thank you, John. Thank, Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Poor guy. Okay. We should have done that first so, before okay. we asked him. <laughs> so, um, okay, so the next item, uh, we're looking at the approval of the principal gives jobs description. This is the one that came before us last time. It's now been amended. Um, and so we want to take a look at it and see if there's any other further concerns. Mr. Hainer. 
Uh, just a point at the uh, dealing with the, the transition part for the person. Uh, I think it's important for us to, con to realize that the stipend, it needs a job description for that stipend. That's all. What would be expected of this person during this year and things of that nature. Uh, sure. Before we, we it, it, as we, and I would ask the job description and a recommended uh, amount for us to, to ponder. Um, may I continue? Yeah. Um, under qualifications, my question, I guess, is to uh, the superintendent, because the superintendent and our designees are going to be, these qualifications, are all these qualifications to be a candidate? Or are some, is, do you see flexibility? And if so, could you identify those? And I, that may not be. The, the answer is yes. I mean, there's pre preferences, but it, it'll depend upon who applies. Um, I, we I, certainly want I mean, to see some teaching experience. Right, the, fr the first one, a master's degree or, h or higher from accredited college. I don't see that much flexibility in that as far as administration and things of that. But you have to have a master's right, degree okay. to be an administrator. Fine, so that, that wouldn't be. Um, <clears throat> down number four, previous administrative uh, experience required. Is there a minimum? Do you have a minimum? One year, five no, we years? we did not put a minimum in there. I know you didn't. I'm asking, I'm trying to understand. To me, that's very open-ended. Do you have a minimum in your head? To, uh, Everybody that would be, well, I shouldn't say that. I don't know who in, will apply, but my assumption is that it will be a current administrator in the district uh, applying, so it would have administrative experience. And my last issue is down under terms of employment. Uh, <coughs> I have no problem with the concept of 12-month position. But five weeks vacation, I know that's standard for right now, but that to me belongs in a contract, not in a job description necessarily. Vacation and holiday, the, yes. being specific of five weeks, uh, that, that's my opinion. That I don't see that it as a deal part, breaker. It is part, no, it is part of uh, contract negotiations. I, right, yes. and I'm just saying in the job description, 12-month position should be a job description. Specifics on, on things like that I don't think should belong in a job. That's my opinion. That's in, in fact, I don't think that we've done that before is put uh, benefits. Uh, yeah, I mean, I usually would say on uh, po school spring posting, you know, competitive benefits or something mm -hmm. like yeah. that. That to me it. belongs yeah. in a job description, not the specificity. Okay. That's all. Right. Thank no, you. Makes sense. I agree. That's good. I agree. Thank you. Anyone else? <clears throat> Comments, questions, concerns? Mr. Slifen. Yeah, where are we on the um, Odyssey search? Well, let's get well, through this first. Oh, no, and then no, 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 no. Why? No, the reason why is that uh, I expressed at the previous meeting that I wasn't ready to move forward here without really being firm on the Odyssey search. Uh, so that's why I'm asking oh, that's okay. how's, I, I forgot uh, about that. how's the uh, Odyssey search. We are continuing the search. Mm -hmm. This is a short answer to, to that. We do not have... Um, three candidates that we've put forward. That has been how we've done principal searches, and there's good reasons for it. I mean, even just seeing with the CFO, mm -hmm. um, things can change, and it has happened in past searches mm -hmm. in the district where um, we've had people withdraw for personal reasons, for taking another position. Mm -hmm. And so we, when we go forward into a finalist, in, in every principal job and that we've uh, we've advertised and done searches for we have three candidates we do not have three mm -hmm. we are continuing to search it's open-ended we haven't we never put a closing date mm -hmm. on, um, on school spring uh, and I believe that there are uh, another round of interviews coming up in the next week or so okay. so I move approval of the Gibbs principal job description second okay Okay, so um, moved by Mr. Stanley, seconded by Mr. Hayner. Um, further discussion? I know you were by. I'll abstain okay. uh, in that uh, I don't think we're ready to go forward if we don't have the Odyssey resolved. Got it. Okay. Um, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? Two. Okay, so two abstentions, Mr. <coughs> Hayner, Mr. Schlickman. Uh, everyone else uh, um, in favor. And um, I should take the opportunity to welcome Julianne Keyes, um, uh, our AEA rep. Um, sorry, we didn't do that earlier. Welcome. Um, okay, so 
so the next item on the agenda, the uh, Director of Gui Guidance Job Description. All right, so this is an updated um, and new kind of job description we've had in the past, Directors of Guidance and Wellness, and um, the focus of this position would be obviously guidance services in the district, um, guidance counseling, and all other types of counseling, social, emotional, supervising social workers, adjustment counselors, um, really leading district effort in conjunction with other professionals, in conjunction with the superintendent, assistant superintendent, director of special ed, mm -hmm. would be heavily involved in working with this individual on the areas of so social emotional learning, which is a big focus of the district and all of our teachers and, and uh, social workers, guidance counselors, psychologists, people in the district who work on this, and to really put together um, a cohesive um, curriculum on social emotional learning and, and continue what we've what we've already started some some good work in the district. Um, this position would also be someone who would have sort of the leadership expertise to lead the department, both the, you know, the guidance department in the high school and middle school, and um, lead social work, social workers in the district, and, and really be able to, to lead and guide professional development activities for these groups, and to supervise them in, um, it, and evaluate them, and which is really um, something that we're looking for, someone with that kind of expertise to do, because we have in the past couple of years, <coughs> Um, been very lean in this area. We have um, not had, um, you know, to because of you know budget constraints and, and other reasons. We've uh, principals, assistant principals, have taken up the the duty of um, supervising, evaluating guidance counselors in the district, and um, they've done a, a good job doing that. But we really are looking to move move this uh, this area forward and have someone with. Um, the, the more subject matter expertise to evaluate these people and to lead the, the initiatives. Can, can you give me a sense, are other districts of our size, do they have this position? Are we a leader in this? Are we behind in this? Uh, Kathy and Laura might know more than I do about that, but. Well, first of all, we had this position. Right, right. Um, what we've done is we've reframed it right. to include SEL. Uh, I think that I know, for example, one of the leaders in this area of, of SEL education <coughs> is Reading, and yes, they do have a, in that district, they have somebody that's just simply mm -hmm. SEL mm -hmm. uh, and not responsible for guidance. I think that every district tries to do um, a hybrid, and which is exactly what we're doing this year. We have people from um, different schools, our director of special ed, another special education coordinator, principal. We have people that are coming together to do this work. Um, and it, the, but each of them have their own jobs, which are in themselves fairly intense and time consuming positions. So what we need is someone that's going to coordinate that effort. And we have not had a director of guidance um, uh, for a number of years now. and. Um, it is something that we believe that we need to, to put in again. Our, our numbers are growing, and the one thing you can see when you do an analysis of growth, while our enrollment is growing, our number of teachers are growing, the number of administrators have not. All right, question, um, questions, comments, Mr. Carton. Uh, yeah, so I have no doubt that of the need for the position, but just uh, a question on the, the description. So the social workers are primarily, or a large portion of their time is IEP driven, special education. So I don't see anything in here about the relationship with the director of special ed and, ha and how the director of special ed will have some supervision over their social workers or how all that would, would work. Well, I'm not sure that this is all social workers in the district. I, I think that your point is well taken. Um, currently at the elementary level, there's a hybrid. Uh, the school social worker who also works with gen ed students as well as special education students is supervised by the principal. Whereas program social workers are, are supervised by a coordinator in special education. And we have a sort of a similar kind of hybrid um, situation at the secondary level. I think the intent of this 
and there may be, may be some uh, crossover, but certainly the social workers who have, have both responsibilities. I think this is something that we will work out. I, um, and in fact, one of the things that happens when we set up our evaluations, we frequently have two evaluators, a primary and a secondary. And I suspect that that kind of relationship will occur here. Because there's people in content areas we want to help um, supervise. And we also want the people working closely with them. At, at the elementary level, the principal works every day with the social workers. So perhaps that person is a, the principal one. And those are things that we'll, we'll figure out. I don't think we have it in black and white right now. Yeah, yeah, Ms. Elmer has spoken to me about this. She does want to be heavily involved with this position. I, you know, in terms of whether you know, she would be, uh, we have it in the job description that the assistant superintendent is the supervisor because the assistant superintendent yeah, really supervisors all, all the curriculum leaders in the district. And uh, what other districts have a model where they have a director of student support services where this might fall under that. And if, um, you know, if we had a, we, we don't have that model here where if we did, then that director could supervise this. But um, that may be something to consider in the future. But she would be and, and is interested in being heavily involved and, and work with whoever takes this position to uh, coordinate social workers and social emotional learning. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Oh, I, actually, uh, Ms. Keys. I just. Oh yes, of course. I'm sorry to interrupt. I do have a no, question. Um, a lot of our students who are on 504s are supervised by guidance counselors directly, um, mm -hmm. and there is a lot of work sort of coordinating, particularly transitions for students who are on 504s. Would coordinating all of that be something that would fall under this leadership position as well? Uh, do you want to? Do you want to? Yeah, I'm, I'm 504 coordination for the district. This comes out of my office, okay. um, and right now this is not one of the um, job um, on the job um, responsibilities for this individual. Um, even though I don't um, supervise those folks. If there's a problem with 504, the team and the parent disagrees for whatever reason, then it can be appealed to my office. Okay. So that's how it's handled right now. Mm -hmm. it, again, it's, it's not so black and white. The, right. the person here probably would be more on the hands as a, as a consultant, um, somebody that would support guidance counselors who are involved in that. But at the same time, then there is somebody who is the coordinator for the district. We actually, you know, this is something that we debated as to whether this person would take this on, and, and it's very possible that this could grow to that. Um, we had some concern that we'd not overload this job position right at the onset. And we'll just see how, as you know only too well, we, we're always reevaluating and, and adjusting as, as circumstances dictate. Dr. Allison Ampey. Um, two questions. First, who does the evaluations right now for the people that would now later be done by the director of guidance? I'm wondering whose loads are being lightened. So it's one of the deans at the high school is evaluating the guidance counselors at the high school. Mm -hmm. One of the assistant principals at the middle school is evaluating the guidance counselors at the middle school. And then the principals are evaluating the social workers in their building. And then, as Dr. Brody said, the, guidance, the special ed coordinators are evaluating the special ed social workers um, in their buildings or the buildings that they, they have oversight for. Um, mm -hmm. So I don't know if I'm missing anybody who is evaluating. So we would take those <coughs> evaluation load, that part of the evaluation loads off of the dean and the assistant principal. And really, that mm -hmm. um, this person would be um, primary for the guidance counselors in okay. both high school and middle school, um, and then we'd work some, figure it out as you know shared uh, evaluation responsibility for the social workers in the, the building-based social workers. Right. I think. We also, as I said, we have this uh, primary and secondary. It's very the, while they may have the primary, I think that yeah. we also want assistant principals sure. and principals 
to be part of the evaluation system for everybody in their building. So they may take on an observation. Um, and, and this is something that we've worked with the union laying this out. So it's very clear at the beginning of the year exactly who is being supervised and who's the secondary. And it's it's quite it, it's quite systematic. Um, then my other question was whether in their performance responsibilities, I'm wondering if there's any point to having some mention made of applying for grants or or anything because that's this area. I mean, the social mission it seems to be right now where a lot of grants right. are, and just it seems like that would be something that this person would be in a really good position. I mean, with the knowledge base that you're asking for, mm -hmm. <laughs> would be in a really good position to do that. Um, so that was just a thought. When we've gone for grants, generally the first person they'll talk to is Julie Dunn who is our one her, among her many titles that's her role and and when we've gone for very big grants and we've been quite successful for example project success that that would pretty much qualify as an SEL grant that was involved a lots of people working on that grant um, but then one person has to have primary responsibility and that's usually uh, Julie Other questions, comments? Mr. Rainer, no? Yes. Um, up at the, uh, under the qualifications, uh, I'm concerned of the potential of a person coming on board that has a master's in education um, and then going down further, uh, possesses a, a DESE license as a supervisor and a director, wouldn't have the basic qualifications. Those are two of the things that you have. In other words, I could come in with a master's in education, not say, not related to the issue here and be qualified under number one and number two have a, a license as a supervisor director without specifying in the year I'm just concerned about that I'm sharing that with you uh, up above um, and number one it says related field uh, could that be somebody that had uh, uh, speech uh, pathology a masses in uh, speech or something like that it's possible um, I'm, I'm just nervous with such w. broad terms, I that's all. I think when we put the qualifications, we're looking at the totality of the qualifications. And so, you know, if you took an ideal candidate, and I don't know, I mean, would have, you know, a master's in education counseling or, or social work and have worked as a social worker or guidance counselor in a school district for several years, got an administrator license. I mean, those kinds of, that progression is what we're looking for. I appreciate that. I'm just looking, I'm not asking you to write such a job description, you have the purest person coming, but some of the broader terms, you're gonna end up getting people that you have to take the time, read it and say, they don't make it. Well, that, you know, that's all I'm saying, I, under related fields. You mean that they wouldn't apply for no, it? No, they would apply, oh. but in reality, a degree in education, a degree in supervision I, that doesn't. I suspect that always happens no matter what. Right, but I'm, <laughs> right? I, I'm just, okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, down under number seven, demonstrated in-depth knowledge of social and emotional learning. I had to get to number seven to get to the emotional part, the social and emotional part. The emphasis is mainly on guidance and things of that nature up to that point. And then number 10 is the next one, social and emotional learning. My biggest concern uh, is asking this person to do all of this, and including supervision of clerical people as well, in a 205-day Part. Well, there's only two clerical people who would be involved. There's one. I just added that. Yeah. Even if you took those out. Yeah. This is a, a, not only an awful lot of work, but to me, the social and emotional part should be, in my mind, the driving factor going forward right now. This is a, a major concern and dealing with our children at all grade levels and stuff. And in 205 days, I think this should be a year round job especially with the part where we're talking about having this person provide program research and provide programs and provide PD and uh, all sorts of things f to build these programs and make them work. Uh, I think this is asking an awful lot and I'd be very concerned. If we go forward with the 205 day position, I would ask us at this time next year to truly evaluate this and find out if we've made the progress and, and the help with the kids that we, we're trying to deal with in this. Uh, Mr. Schlichten. Mm -hmm. Second meeting in a row where we're making sausage at the table. 
uh, uh, it would be my recommendation for any future job descriptions we run it through subcommittee first. Fine. Um, I just have, there's just a, a, a typo in here. Uh, so uh, it's where the district's focus on college and career readiness. <clears throat> So, this is in the job, is job goals. The job goals. Between mm -hmm. district uh, focus and college. Yes. Mr. So I mean, I'm comfortable with this job description, mm -hmm. and I'm comfortable approving it tonight. I think <clears throat> the district can take the comments that were made and improve it, but I think it's, I think it's for me, it's it's approval ready. I don't, I don't really want to spend more time on this. So I'm going to move we approve the job description. Uh, for Director of Guidance, Social Emotional Learning. Second. Second. Okay. Seconded by Dr. <coughs> Alice Nampi. Um, okay, uh, more discussion, we're ready to vote. Okay, <coughs> all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Aye. Okay. Nay. Um, so it's six to one? Okay, six to one. Uh, okay, <coughs> uh, next item, hey, we're, we're ahead of schedule. Don't say that. <laughs> is that going to jinx it? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, it's like no one in January should say something like, oh, the snow and renewable yep, budget is exactly. doing well. Because every time someone makes that comment, yeah, two weeks us, later, we get snow slammed. Snow tomorrow. <laughs> so no one should ever make that comment. You've got to say right. it out loud. Or, oh, oh. <laughs> okay. So uh, the next item in the agenda, um, I just wanted to, uh, we want to have a more robust discussion, it seemed like, last time on the uh, town warrant article. Uh, to make this a sanctuary town or a trust fund town. There's different language that's used that I don't. Not a trust fund. Trust, trust, no, not trust, trust fund. Trust <laughs> trust I'm fine. all for that. Sorry, trust, yeah, town, trust, for trust act town. I'm on my trust act but, town. Yeah. Sorry, you're right. Trust act town. <clears throat> uh, and I understand there's a distinction. I don't know the distinction. Maybe someone else can, does. Um, but what just seemed like there was a desire to have a more robust uh, conversation, so we put it on the agenda tonight um, Why? to have that conversation. Because it was brought up as one of the articles for our discussion. I know. Yeah. Well, we, just, it, do we think we should vote on th it? There seemed to be there was a desire to talk about this, so, so I wanted to put it on, and we we decided so it wasn't on the agenda last time that we should put it on. It the agenda was this also time. a I don't know whether consensus, but a discussion whether the school committee would actually come with like, look at policies in other districts yep. and stuff and and devise a policy for our own. So that's what broadened the discussion. All right, so actually there are two sort of issues here, right? So one issue is what is our reaction to um, what's going on at town meeting and the thing the town meeting is going to vote on, right? And then the second question is do we as a school committee want to take any action via resolution, via policy change um, to show our students that they are safe and supported? So I think those are sort of two questions. They're related, but, um, but yeah. Let me get Dr. Allison Abbey. I had thought that this was going to go to policy. I was it, confused. It, yeah, me too. So, so there are two <laughs> things. It was going to go to policy. Policy hasn't met yet. Mm -hmm. um, and so, why, so, so I thought, and there was a desire to have a discussion last time, which we said, let's table it to this time. So that's why we put it on the agenda. But, but you're absolutely right that policy was going to look at it. They haven't met yet. So I thought maybe we can give guidance to policy if we want to. Got it. Yes, Mr. Hainer. It, you all got a copy at the, at the end of uh, and know us on the trust re resolution. Mm -hmm. At the bottom of the trust resolution, there is a um, a piece. It, it ends. Be it further resolved that nothing in this resolution shall be construed to prohibit any town agency or department from providing an, another law or enforcement agency information required to be provided by a state or federal law, including U.S. Code. Uh, 8 U.S. Code, Section 1373. That code specifically says all the things it does not require. My feeling is every time I've communicated with the police, and I'll get to the education part of it, the police department has stated that we, they are already, they do absolutely nothing beyond what this, the resolution is going to provide. The resolution has no enforcement capability. The police do not give out free information on anybody, including immigrants or any uh, non-citizens. The school side, there are massive state regulations in, in, and uh, laws prohibiting the dissemination of any records about any student or their family without a warrant. 
Now, if somebody wants to, and I'm not trying to be sarcastic, and I apologize to anybody that takes offense to this, it's not my intent. This country has a history about uh, not obeying laws uh, at the beginning of our country because they felt that they, the civil disobedience. This resolution does not suggest that. If a, somebody comes to the police department and asks for copies of existing records, they don't have to give them without a warrant. We don't give anything without a warrant. So my concern is the possibility, as far-fetched as it might be, federal money being denied us because we've put a label on us. That's my concern. Uh, Mr. Slipin. Uh, there's uh, every possibility that uh, federal money is going to evaporate no matter what we do. Um, every time I turn around, there's a new budget proposal to starve cities and towns and social programs. Uh, this is a statement of what we do now. This is a statement of what our police department is doing right now. And the resolution that's coming before town meeting does talk about the police department. Now, the latest statement out of the Trump administration has been that they will go after certain public safety grants that may or may not exist anyway. Um, the arguments that were made in public were that we're about to build a new high school and we wouldn't want to lose federal money. Well, there's no federal money there. Uh, but the most important thing, I think, for us is our obligation to keep our students safe. And not only is it an obligation to keep our students safe, but it's an obligation for us to communicate to all members of our community that we are intent on keeping them safe. Yeah. The real issue before us, which has been stated on the other side of the street, <clears throat> is that the police department wants to maintain an environment in which people can talk to them without any fear. ICE went in today in Lawrence and arrested people who were coming for routine interviews in, in the immigration office. It's getting nutty out there. We don't do business that way. Uh, the biggest threat in terms of violence in any community such as this is usually a domestic incident or an incident involving somebody you know. And somebody who is worried about immigration may not take the steps to protect themselves or their family. This is a common sense public safety resolution that not only expresses what we're doing, but it also tells each and every one of our neighbors that we're going to be standing with them. As a town meeting member, I intend to vote for this because the question of what happens to the schools if we adopt this resolution and the, the Trump administration somehow comes after our money, I, I think is really a non-issue for a couple of reasons. First of all, any federal money we get is being dispensed by the state. We don't get the money directly from the federal government. Secondly, um, if, the, if, uh, if the national administration is going after communities, they're going to be going after far bigger communities with a far bigger budget impact than us. And there's going to be a lot of effort out there to defend the larger communities with a larger share of uh, state and federal funding uh, in, in case of a problem. I think that because the question has been put before us, what happens to the schools if this resolution is adopted, I think that puts us in a position where we should be ready in town meeting uh, to answer the question if it comes about. Now, I've read the, re the proposed resolution by the selectmen. This is not a radical resolution. It's basically a statement of what we're already doing and a statement to our community that we are going to stand by you and we're going to protect you. For that reason, I'd like to move that the school committee endorse the selectmen's uh, recommended vote under this article. Second. Um, more uh, comments, uh, Mr. Cardin. 
Uh, thank you. So, a as a town meeting member, I definitely will support this resolution, but it doesn't address the schools that whatsoever, and I don't think we should set the precedent of voting on matters that really have no direct relationship to the schools. Uh, okay. excuse, excuse me. It, the second to last piece says, be it further resolved that town meeting supports and encourages each town department and official from refusing to gather or disseminate information. We are part of that that part of the resolution, so it does affect us. So, so, um, so to, to Mr. Hardin's point, um, I think one of the things that people in the community have seen is they've seen neighboring communities, um, school departments, uh, school administration, and school committees come out with very strong statements um, showing that they support children, showing that, um, saying that children are safe in their communities. And I think there's a little bit of antsiness. And why, why has Arlington not done that? Um, when all <coughs> these other towns nearby have done a statement like that. Um, so, um, so this is why we thought at one point to send it to policies. It's not clear. I mean, now that we're changing over, I'm not sure when policy is meeting next. Um, so the question is whether we want to craft a, a statement as a school We have a committee. motion on the floor. Though. Yeah. We've got to deal with that. Okay. Um, Okay, Mr. Schlickman, uh, we have a motion to, on the floor. To, to, the, Actually, to, the, so, to uh, the chair's yeah. point, uh, that yes, I mean, the Somerville resolution uh, and the attached policy is something that requires more deliberation, and that should go to a policy committee when we reconstitute ourselves. But I think that in light of the fact that this resolution is before town meeting and we know what it is, uh, I, I, I think it's certainly within our domain to voice an opinion. Okay. Uh, Mr. Stillman. So <clears throat> I, I, uh, I take Len's point. The problem, there's, uh, the, the uh, moderator is going to allow 10 minutes for each side to speak. Mm -hmm. So it's going to be difficult for the school committee to get up and say much during the 10 minutes because I think you're going to prepare different speakers for both sides. So uh, there's a value in the school committee saying that we support the resolution and uh, that, that because many of us are town meeting members and that being stated um, prior to the meeting. But that's no part of the meeting. Okay. Mr. Hainer. I would ask through the chair how this resolution or any resolution would have prevented what happened in Lawrence today. No, it wouldn't have. Well. And, and I'm just saying, I think it's important for people to stand up for their beliefs. I think it's very important, and I applaud that. My, this, a lot of people believe on one side that if we pass this, this will open our doors to the town, to every immigrant, criminal. I talked to some elderly at a building. I'm serious. <laughs> they, they've taken it to one extreme. Another group honestly believes that if we don't pass this, no immigrant would ever be allowed in the town. This has no impact whatsoever. And a lot of people are voting. I think it's laudable that people want to support. I want to tell every child in our community and every parent in our community, we are not going to do anything different in the safety of their children, and I mean that sincerely, whether this resolution gets passed or doesn't get passed. We're not making a decision on safety for our children. We're making a statement, and the statement is just what it is. It's a group of words. It has no impact one way or the other, up or down. Thank you. Yes, Dr. Allison Epi. Okay, so part of the reason I was asking why it wasn't sent to policy first was that I feel there's some background that we haven't gotten here. Um, but since we were going to discuss it today, I called up Joe Kira, one of the selectmen, to try and get some of the questions answered that <clears throat> I had. So one question I had was just, what's the goal of this? Mm -hmm. You know, why are why is it being proposed? Mm -hmm. And what they're trying to suggest is to have town meetings support the police in policies that they're already doing mm -hmm. but right now they're doing it because chief ryan has decided to do it if you take chief ryan out of the picture for whatever reason um they wanted to be sure that there's a directive from town of the mm -hmm. sense of where we want to be going um and also to let people to let immigrants and other people around them understand what the expectation is of the police you know so that just to what mr schlickman said so that people are feeling comfortable going to the police not feeling like oh well the police are going to be the right. arm of the ice and come and get you um to speak to 
Mr. Cardin's point, whether or not this applies to the schools, the schools have a role as a, as a mandated reporter in terms of child abuse or teachers, yes, are mandated the, reporters. But that doesn't go to uh, any government, uh, uh, that's that, very that, private. Sir. Let Dr. Allison Abbey speak. My point is that this makes it clear to teachers or others that they needn't fear if they report a child who's they're not sure about. For a no, no, wait, wait, Dr. Allison Abbey has the floor. Dr. Allison Abbey has the floor. One person. My point is if a teacher had a concern about a child who is an immigrant and they're, cons they're they don't know, but they're pretty sure it's right. not, not. Right. You know, illegal or whatever. An document. Whatever. Yeah. Um, this, I thought, would make it more clear that even if the police are involved because of the abuse, you know, as if it rolls down to that, that the police are not then going to involve um, ICE and, and right. stuff. Um, I can see Mr. Hainer's face on. I'm just going to keep going. Um, uh, okay. No, but I'm yeah. saying that to me that is something that suggests that that we could do. I think we may want to have our own separate whatever right. resolution. Okay. Um, just a sec. Um, thinking about the concerns. The things that I've heard are mostly the funding. Mm -hmm. I understand that you know it's funding is decreasing and stuff. I think a lot of times people have been giving that concern short shrift. I don't think that is fair to the people who are thinking that. I think they're looking at five. The, right now, there's five million dollars a year coming into the town, and then if that goes away, that blows a really big hole in the town's budget, mm -hmm. and that they're feeling like they can't handle the property tax. You know, the only way that we can increase the money is to get property tax. And they're already feeling like they're short and they can't do it. Um, I asked him how likely, if they had talked to town council and how likely it was felt that this would happen. And it's basically if the administration follows the laws according to normal legal standards. There's case law and stuff that would say no. Yeah. The problem is, and the concern that people have, is that this administration is not always following things. The, the behavior is not always conforming to normal legal standards. And so where do we go? I don't know. Um, I had, I was concerned that some of this was being done so that we would sort of get the sanctuary town badge. <laughs> no, I'm serious. I, I feel like that's some of the discussion is is like that and just, you know, let's just do this. I found actually looking at the resolution and what it says much more compelling to me mm -hmm. that it supports the and that's why I asked us yeah. to get it into know is because I think that's really what we should be looking at for this right. discussion mm -hmm. um, that it talks about what we're doing and what the expectations are of the police and and more about why we're doing it and um for those reasons i feel that it would be a reasonable thing for the school committee so, to support so, so i just want to add something i was at a um, state hearing yesterday on um, the statewide initiative to make a safe <coughs> um, state and um, the funding issue came up um, the consensus in that room was that it wouldn't pass constitutional muster that there was really, really strong um, case precedent, specifically decided by Roberts and Scalia, <laughs> that basically said that the federal government doesn't have the power to claw back money um, because the state refuses. You know, mm -hmm. that there's a lot about separation of powers and the Tenth Amendment, and um, so I, I'm not saying that's not a legitimate worry, but there is a lot of discussion at the legal circles about whether that threat would pass any constitutional muster. Yeah. Just the concerns that I'm hearing are that, no, it won't pass legal muster, but in the meantime, they're holding the check. Right, right. And so, yeah. you know, we still have two years or three years of $5 million short. Right, mm. right. And that's Right, problem. I get yeah. it. Okay, uh, Dr. I, I mean, Dr. Bodhi um, had something to add? Um, I, I, what I want to add, because the question is, how does this affect the schools in terms of our role in a, in a town that is a sanctuary? Uh, city or town 
Right now, the schools do not ask for any documentation. Mm -hmm. Our only, uh, the only thing that we're really looking at are age and date of birth in terms of placement. And if a student is coming from an out of state or an, uh, another community, really looking at grades Address. and so it's, and then residency. Um, we do not in any way seek out that information. And we certainly, one, we don't have the information and we are guided by very strong uh, regulations by the federal government, FERPA laws, that, that prevent us from releasing any information. I think that th you'd almost have to have a subpoena by a court in order to get any kind of information. And in fact, I'm going to, uh, I'm in the process of writing um, a memo to all parents so that they are very clear about the role um, of schools in, in this issue, not sanctuary, but in terms of um, immigration. So, and, and also providing some resources. But um, I, I think it's more, I don't want to really comment on the, 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 the warrant article itself, but in terms of the schools, it, it, it would not affect how we operate. Okay, okay Mr. Hainer. Dr. Bordy covered most of it. I would ask uh, people that have concerns about records and reporting. 603 uh, Code of Massachusetts Regulation 23.05, privacy and student records. It is the most detailed way. I mean, what teachers, administrators have to go through to, to, to even consider releasing records to appropriate people. As far as mandated reporting, that is one of the most privacy-driven areas so that people are free to, gi to give that. And, anybody uh, releasing those things, uh, those records, to a non-qualified person, the state gets all over. It is massive uh, punishing those people. So I want to support our people. I want our people, everybody to feel safe. And I agree with Dr. Uh, with uh, what the chair said as far as the potential not being uh, constitutional. I just, this particular resolution, and I apologize, I don't mean this to be insulting, but it's a feel-good resolution. It has no teeth, it has no, it gives no added protection to anybody. If people want to do it, fine. I just want people to understand that it doesn't change the status of our students, it doesn't change the status of our citizens. Okay, Dr. Allison Anthony. I just wanted to clarify, I wasn't, implying that anyone was releasing records to someone not qualified what i was saying was that it would if a st if a teacher had concerns about a student who they suspected they didn't know but they suspected was um mm -hmm. would fall into one of the categories that are at risk to me it would if they know that the directive from the town is not to involve ice and stuff to the police. It would make it easier to start making referrals into that than if they felt like, if you think about the opposite, if our town has decided that it's going to join in and you know we're gonna scoop everybody up, um, that teacher might feel torn about what's the best thing to do for the child because you know they can report the abuse but then the child might get picked up and that, that's what I was trying to say. I okay. wasn't, suggesting anything about release of records to inappropriate. Right, I think we're ready to take a vote. Um, so the motion on table by Mr. Thielman, seconded. Mr. Schlickman. Oh, Mr. Schlickman, sorry, seconded by Mr. Thielman. That was it, sorry. Yes. Um, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? No. Okay. Abstentions? Abstentions? Okay. One opposition, one abstention. Okay. Um, where are we at? Oh, okay, superintendent's report. All right. Long report? Yes, long report? Long report. Okay. Well, first of all, let's start with the update on school buildings projects. Um, I think the most notable news this week is that steel is going up at Thompson. And um, we've been waiting for this, and we don't have yet a revised schedule, but uh, that is being requested to be available by next week but that is that's a good step forward uh, today we had a meeting with the uh, uh, with a number of people in the district uh, direct, Dr. Chesson, Director of Technology and um, our 
architect and procurement people for Stratton and looking at the technology um, that um, we're going to purchase for that building. As If you remember, uh, Stratton as part of this renovation plan is going to be a one-to-one -one school. And um, what, what was has been decided, that wasn't decided today, but what has been decided is that we're going to do iPads in K to 2 and then Chromebooks 3 to 5. Oh, iPads uh, at K to 2, two will be without keyboards, Chrome, um, iPads with keyboards, keyboards. For, for grade 3 and then Chromebooks for 4 and 5. Okay. They have the new iPads apparently have a snap-in keyboard, so that's what we're going to, that's the plan. And there were a lot of questions about projections, but anyway, that is well on its way as, as well. Um, Gibbs is moving forward. Um, we're probably, I'm going to be sending out a notice to the advisory committee that we're going to have another meeting soon, uh, probably the 6th of April. Um, getting con confirmation from the architects, I think they're ready to come back for the, you know, for more feedback on the, the revisions they've made based on the previous feedback. So that's moving forward as well, uh, both in terms of the building project as well as the, uh, this, this aspect of it. Um, Hardy, well, we'll just, we're in sort of a holding until we get to town meeting. If we have the funds, then we're gonna move very quickly to uh, secure the project teams. The, the, um, the high school, um, we have, the RFP for the OPM, the Owners Project Manager, ready to be submitted to MSBA. In fact, I think we're submitting it tomorrow. So that's moving along quite well. And we have a, um, a building meeting next, this coming Monday. Um, and uh, Mr. Thielman, our chair, has approved the agenda. I approve the agenda. Actually, it's not, it's not it's Monday. Monday. It's, it's Tuesday. It's Tuesday. Yeah, it's Tuesday. I'm sorry. It's right before the Permanent Town Building Committee. I do. I do. <laughs> Yeah. Tuesday. Tuesday. There's another meeting Monday. I can't remember what it is, but there's another one. No, there's, there's a meeting every night. There's a meeting every <laughs> night, almost. Um, <coughs> yeah. So that pretty much, Stratton, I think we're on, I think all is moving forward at the pace it needs to. We just hope the Thompson pace picks up. May I just ask a question on the, uh, the Chromebooks and, and, and the iPads and stuff? Will their professional development being, is that part of uh, bringing these in for the teachers and stuff? Yeah, the, I mean, these are not new. We've been having professional development on us, utilizing right. this tool for but, the past but now five years. I mean, I'm just thinking, if I've had some in the classroom versus a whole, an entire classroom, my approach to a lot of areas might change. Well, a lot of the, what's really nice about Stratton is they've had um, one cart to every two teachers okay. for like three or four years. But we would certainly provide whatever professional support. development right. and support that the teachers feel like they need. Thank you. As we move forward with this too, we're, we're considering what Chromebooks as well. There's different mm -hmm. manufacturers of them and different uh, options that, that didn't cool. even exist a year ago. So that's part of the research over the next week. Okay, uh, we just some more the questions, comments. Dr. Allison, just with the Chromebooks, do they have touch screens? Well, just funny funny, you, funny you should ask that because one of the things that I learned in that conference I went to is that HP has put out a new um, touchscreen Chromebook and PC all under $300. Hmm. Now, we, do, we know that there's a memory, it's, it's a minimum memory at 64 gigabytes. I don't want to go into all the details, but we are researching that because to be able to combine the two yeah. would be great because a lot of the apps that we would want to use do do better yes. in a touchscreen environment. Yeah, that's actually, why I was asking. We actually have a um, Acer model of Acer and a a a S -U -S, Asus, um, both also have touchscreens, and we have an Acer model in house that we've had for about a couple weeks now to take a look at it. So we, we can get um, test models to make sure to, for the teachers to look at. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Carton. Yeah, I was wondering if you could update us on the Gibbs costs, because um, that's probably going to come before a town meeting. Yeah. Mm. Yes, um, I think we're the the Gibbs costs are right at the number. They're, they're we're twenty five million in the, the debt override, but there the town manager has been identifying um, other sources of monies. Can one, you explain one, the well, one of the one issue is that yeah. when the DOR allows you to increase the amount of money in a debt exclusion based on an escalator, mm -hmm. depending on when the override was and when you actually get the money. And so that, that ability to do that will provide some extra funds. And um, 
there's an, a, an, another source that he has identified. So the, what the goal is, is to have, um, I think it's 27 million is the number. Do you want to give us a background of I, sort of I, I'd how I'd rather come prepared changed. with all, what, pardon? Do you want to give us a background of, of sort of why that number is different than what we thought a year ago? Well, because costs change. And um, one of the things that is true in the Gibbs project, we have very generous contingency funds in, in the design and in construction. And I think the people who have been um, looking at this affirm that they're generous. And because of the thoroughness in which um, Shamit and, and uh, um, our architects have looked at the building, yes, there, in an old building there could be some surprises, but anticipating a couple of them, for example, in looking at the exterior walls and the interior walls, there is, um, if you're going to run the kind of wiring that we're going to need data, it, 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 it is potentially, when you open those up, could be potentially leading to tr tremendous cost adjustments upward. <laughs> so the architects have proposed at, at a much lower cost, to, and this will actually be very en energy efficient as well, is to build a wall in front of a wall so that there would be a conduit space in between the two. Um, to run all the wires, so we're not going to have to touch any of the exterior walls in the building. It's things like that that are starting to minimize the surprises that you would expect to have in an older building. Uh, one of the other things that when we were looking at the cost estimates last year, there were things that weren't considering doing. The biggest issue was windows. And, and then the, the original cost estimates on the building thought, well, maybe we can keep these windows. But the more thought was given to it is if you're going to want to have a building around for the next 50 years, you, you should replace the windows now, not later, because of just the cost and the disruption. Hmm. So that increased the cost. And then um, there were you know, increases in the exterior of the building as well, um, doing much more extensive repair than was originally hmm. thought to do. So those are the kinds of cost pressures. So then. That's what's going to require to go above the 25. But, as I said, the contingencies are quite generous. And the people have been working on this feel that it's, it's important that you identify the monies that for the budget, but at the same time, do we think we'll come in lower? Yes. Is that That's what you were yeah. asking me? Yeah, or so the, that point is, more the point is that the, yeah, the point is that town meeting is going to be asked to vote for 27 million, yes. the voters only approved 25 million. Yes. We need to have a very clear and concise explanation about why that increased and th that was in right. there. Um, but I think we need to be a little more crisp on that yeah, explanation. Yeah. <laughs> yes, I, 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 well, I, you asked me out of the, uh, without really yeah, giving, having all the notes here in terms of why, but yes, I agree that it has to be crisper than that. And I don't think that we would go into the details of all the things that we're doing to cut the costs or, and the surprises of the project. But the town manager will be presenting this to town, ma to okay, town meeting. Thank you. Great. Yes, that was not as crisp as it could be. <laughs> all right. Um, so one of, the, one of the things we wanted to do tonight was to do um, a review of progress on goals across the board. You've you've heard much this year and I, I and sometimes um, one of the things I think we probably should do better than we have been is identify in an agenda what goal might be uh, a presentation relating to and, and Ms. Fitzgerald and I have talked about that so I've done a summary of different presentations um, that relate to that but um, one of the particular updates we wanted to have tonight was an extension of talking about goal 1.1, which has to do with the learning standards and progressions in each discipline. You've actually heard quite a bit this year, and you will hear more this spring. You've heard from the Director of World Language, the Lead Teacher in Family and Consumer Science, Director of Social Studies History, and Director of English Language Arts, who really, I think, express quite well the kind of work they're doing in their district to identify learning standards, progression in the discipline, 
how their how their assessments are changing and aligning with the, their uh, their goals. And in fact, that group has been working with Dr. Chesson in trying to define what is a learner to our school system. Yeah, so Dr. Chesson is going to, she is going to present talk at this point. more about, and I think at our retreat there was sort of a desire to get a better understanding of goal 1.1. 1 .1. Um, hold on, Dr. Uh, Mr. Carton. Yeah, so I mean, the, the presentations I heard were sort of general curriculum updates, right. which were wonderful, but this goal speaks to what I thought was going to be a list of essential learning standards and progressions. Right. Okay. Is that being developed or is that something else? Okay, so Dr. Chesson is going to. Great, let, great let's question. See if we have okay. <laughs> yeah. That's a great question. So, um, in order to do that, when you start with backwards design, what you want to do is start with your vision, your ultimate vision for the student as learner, and this, and in this case, student as citizen. Because while we do have learning standards that have to do with the content area, they don't very don't very often don't touch on those other skills or um, transferable skills that we would like students to have. Um, so the curriculum team started out by brainstorming what are the transferable skills. What are the skills we want every student to have as both a learner and as a citizen? And we worked on that draft for a, probably about two months and you actually have um, a copy of the draft was uploaded to you today, and you'll see that it says draft, draft, draft all over it. So to really emphasize that we're trying to get the um, input of all the stakeholders in this process, um, that's the place where you have to start. So we'll, um, we presented that to the entire administration team, so that was all the special education coordinators, all the principals, the deans um, uh, this past week. Um, and then got feedback from them and sort of took them through the process that we went through, um, how we identified the transferable goals, what we had looked at in terms of the research around transferable goals, uh, what we've looked at, what other districts um, had put out there so that we're not just reinventing the wheel and then looking for, and also looking for consensus. The next step will be to simultaneously continue to get feedback and refine it, but at the same time, the curriculum people will now start talking about, so if these are the skills, um, if these are the transferable skills that we want students to have, if these are the characteristics of our students as learners and as citizens, what are the experiences that we currently have that are in support of that, that the students are going through, and what are the experiences that students have that are not helpful and to create create that. Um, once we do that, we'll be developing an essential list of um, experiences that we want every student to have. Um, because we're talking about Gibbs right now, that's sort of a microcosm or a pilot of this discussion. So I know that's smack dab in the middle, <coughs> but if we, we know where we want students to end up, so by the time they get to sixth grade, what would they have had to have happen? And by the time they go from sixth grade to high school, what needs to happen there? So it's, it's kind of fortuitous that we're looking at Gibbs and we're talking about what does that curriculum look like. Um, the curriculum directors have really come up with the idea that that sixth grade is a year of transition in. So it's really a big about transition and then transformation from, you know, elementary school student to student who's prepared for secondary work. And so that transformation, what has to happen that, and then the transition out. Um, so we will be presenting this to teacher groups as we go through professional development for the rest of this year. Um, we'll be pre we're presenting it to you and we look forward to your feedback. We'll be um, putting out for public comment for parents. And it's based on um, a description of the graduate that was actually in the technology plan that was put out for, has been put out for public, public comment. Um, that's where we started from. Um, three or four times over the last five years. Um, so we'll be continuing um, to do that. Um, to pick out those essential learning standards, the frameworks for each of the subject areas is about an inch thick. So I don't think you're gonna see, while well, an essential learning standard is, in ELA is you know uh, reading 1.1.3. I think what you're going to find are the things that uh, you see in that draft, and then what experiences are, going to, are going to, students going to have as a focus. So we um, did a text-based discussion on Monday on an article that's put out by two leading researchers in this area that talked about, so if one of the things you want students to be able to do is 
um, are having a, a discussion using argumentation and evidence. What experiences do they have to have in ninth grade? What experiences in 10th grade, 11th, and 12th grade across all subject areas in order to make that? And then how you build on the complexity of that. So in ninth grade, they may be using evidence to support their their own argument, but in 10th grade, they're not only using evidence to support their argument, but evidence that would help them to refute someone else's argument. And then by the time you get into 11th grade, you would get into a full, almost a full-blown debate or um, expertise. So that's kind of where we're going with that. So I'm not sure if that answers your question or gives you an idea about where we're going. Yes, thank you. It, it, it was the way this was presented was that the presentations we had, right. which were very useful and helpful, were tied into this goal, and I don't really think they were. I think you'd have to um, sort of read between the lines. There were, um, there were um, uh, discussions in both presentations, but what we didn't do, and I would agree with you, is that we didn't call to your attention. So this is a transferable skill. Mm -hmm. um, I think I did say that when the social studies teachers were presenting. Mm -hmm. I said, oh, I'm hearing you're all talking about evidence, and I'm, that makes me happy because that is one of the transferable skills. Mm -hmm. So I think that as we have curriculum presentations, we need to call to your attention. This is something that matches our draft of the student as learner, student as citizen. These are transferable skills that we're going to be looking for students to have experience and build on for the K through 12 experience. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Dr. Allison Ampey. Um, so that sounds very interesting. I'm a little confused. How do you translate the experiences into competencies? Because to me, it's the competencies that I want them to bring home. So how do you build that skill within a student? So you may say um, that, to, that when I say experiences, I'm saying what um, do, do students have to know and be able to do in order to demonstrate that they have that competency? So if one of those Okay. Is, okay, so it's not just do it, but well, not. But they, we, they can't just happen magically. They have to have some experience that helps them to acquire that knowledge okay. and those skills. Does that okay. help? Yeah, I, I think you're talking about how do they, experiences that demonstrate the competency. Well, both experiences that help them to gain them and experiences that allow them to demonstrate their mastery. Okay, yes. I understand this is a two-year timeline. So what, yes. can you tell us a little bit about what next year looks like? So next year we will actually be defining those experiences because again, we'll be doing it, if you start with a smaller bite, mm -hmm. so we're looking at Gibbs mm -hmm. and we have three committees and one of those committees will be looking at what are the, where do we want kids to get to by the end of the sixth grade year? So what experiences do they need to have? What skills do we need to develop? What projects might we have to have? What are the emphasis? So one of the things that we've discussed is um, to talk about, um, again, evidence comes to mind a lot because that's what's a really high um, focus of the uh, MCAS Next Generation exam. So what does it look like that students would have to do in science what is it, in order to demonstrate that they are able to use evidence to support argumentation? What would happen in um, English language arts, in math, and in social studies? And then how would you, because you really want them to not be siloed, what kind of cross-curricular projects might you have to have in order for students to see the connection between the use of that ability across? So I would expect that um, by, you know, if not the summer, by the end of the first uh, trimester in the fall, we'll have some concrete examples of what this will look like at Gibbs. Great. Are there questions, comments? <coughs> Okay, so we have more stuff, I know, yeah. on the goals. Yes. Um, I, would, I would add just one small thing, and that is it's not a linear progression either. This is, while we're also trying to do backward design on this, people are already leapfrogging into different, uh, in, in different disciplines into this work. Uh. Um, they're sort of not, they're not waiting to, to, to entirely uh, well, now we've defined what the learner is, and now we're going to do something else. It's it's it has a more um, a synergy to it than might appear this way. So we've talked a little bit about this. Um, what I've done here to sort of have you, to give a summary was to actually take what the goals are and just give you a brief overview um, of what has been going on and talk about a couple of the goals that may not be progressing this year. 
So the first one, uh, the first one we've already talked about, and unless anybody wants to talk some more about that, and I think that as we go through the year, we'll have more information than we can give you. The next one is redefining the educational vision and programs of the high school and identifying, integrating its core values and identified essential habits of mind. There's some strong links between these two. What's happened with this particular goal is, is timelines have changed um, that are sort of, that is determined by the MSBA process. Um, I think that we did not anticipate that the, the part of the feasibility study which <clears throat> involves getting your project teams was, was going to take the time it does because um, when we've done projects on our own in recent years, Stratton for example, <clears throat> even the work we're doing with Gibbs, that, project, that, that, that part of the process has gone more, more quickly. But there are processes with MSBA that you have to follow. And, and, I, and I'm not saying that it's not a good process. I think it's one way that they, they exercise a lot of uh, good oversight on, on building projects. But nonetheless, it has changed what our anticipation of the timeline. Now, the, this particular report that will be submitted to MSBA will probably not be compiled to next year. However, the discussions are still going on now and, and teachers are, and administrators are visiting schools. We did a little bit more extensive questionnaire for MSBA that's, that's a, probably better, a pretty good foundation for the where we're gonna go with this, but the part of this also involves community input, your input, um, parent input, student, teacher. So we're going to go through a, a, a extensive outreach in the fall uh, to finally write this, write this um, vision and a document for MSBA. May I just ask a question? Mm -hmm. Does this have any effect on the timeline <clears throat> to completion? That's what she's saying. Well, mm -hmm. each one of these modules can take they, well, they usually give a range of for time. The high or no, for no, the, no. For the high school, the whole high school no, project? We, we, I thought I heard you say, maybe I misunderstood, that you're going to have to redo something and resubmit. That the goal won't be finished by the end of this year. It will not be done by the end of this year. We have. So does that affect the, the feasibility study? No. Okay. Okay. No, Thank it's you. just the timeline the feasibility study is, is longer than we thought it was going to be. Okay. Thank you. What you do have, which is a you know, so the beginning document on this is what that you received this year from the educational questionnaire we submitted because the, the, the administrators who filled it out um, expanded much more in that than probably was expected by MSBA. Right. The third goal, this is the one that it's going to take more time. This was established a district-wide committee to assess the student support team model the response to intervention process and special education support at all levels and recommend a better model uh, to better meet the needs of students needing academic and social emotional support. What I can say is happening is that individual schools are evaluating their own process. But we have not, um, we have, it is probably was just too ambitious a goal for this year, I'd be honest about it, given all the other projects that are going on right now. But um, the work is going on in individual schools. We have not assembled a district-wide committee at this point, um, and probably will not until next year. If I may? Yeah. Will we be receiving data at the end of next year, or will that push it out a second year out? Well, I would hope that next, we would, we would maybe get the committee going and um, the, the purpose of this goal is, first of all, to, just like we're doing with the SEL this year, sort of assessing where we are. The processes are different in different schools. I didn't know if you needed so to have the committee together for a full year, get it together for a full year and then get the data. It might be. It might be. And so when we revise this, we might need to think about how to, okay. how to put a more reasonable timeline on it. Thank you. And then... Uh, the goal 1-4 is establish a planning committee to assess the district's strengths and challenges in creating safe and supportive school environments for all students and for providing students with social, emotional, and cultural proficiency skills needed for college 
and career readiness and to be a contributing members of a diverse democratic society. A lot of work has gone on, began, began last summer. You've heard um, Ms. Elmer talk about an overview of the process this year, and now we're into the stage where committees have been formed at each school and are tasked with doing an assessment of the school and writing action plans for the school, in which we, we're going to come back as a whole district, because there's a lot of coordination that still would need to take place. But those action plans, as you, as you heard, her talk about at the last meeting will be due in June. Is, is and one comment on the, the language of this goal, I think that you know we all evolve in our thinking about language and how to express things. I don't, we, we were just at a, uh, uh, a talk yesterday and one of the things that a, a person pointed out is that we're never gonna be proficient in, in we're never gonna achieve cultural proficiency. And she encouraged us all to be thinking about cultural awareness because it is a continuum. It is something that we grow with as we, um, if, when we focus on you know, learning more about other cultures. And so I've, in the rewriting of this goal, when we talk about the implementation plans, I think that that's language I wanted to revise. So those were our four goals under goal one, which is um, the goal that we, we look at student achievement and what we want for our students in the schools. Sorry, Mr. Do, sorry to keep bugging you, but on, on uh, the last one there, do you think we would be able to get a report by the end of the year with regard to the assessments and what, mm -hmm. what came out of that? Yes, so they're, they're due in, in June, just, in, early June. So yeah, you, yeah. You will. I think that's important for us to, right. mm -hmm. that and go back to looking at that position that we created tonight as well. Right, and, and then we're going to be developing action plans for next year and, and we'll have the support of AEF in that Great. process. All right, so goal two is about staff excellence and professional development in the, in the school district. And our first goal to advance this vision of the Arlington Public Schools this year was to provide professional development for the implementation of the new science curriculum in grades four and five and the new math curriculum in grades K-1. And, th and that <coughs> did happen. One of the things that I've, uh, I've provided for you, actually I should say Dr. Cheston's provided for you, are the, the, uh, all of the schedules for professional development this year and also a look back on last summer because some of, a lot of the work we do also happens during the summer. But that has happened and um, I think one thing that was also helpful this year, though, um, not, it wouldn't appear in the schedule of PD, is the fact that we have someone who is 0.4, um, who is a high school teacher, biology teacher, who's been leading a lot of this professional development and also acting as a coach to help um, in the classrooms. And the feedback has been very positive on that. And um, hopefully that can continue next year. So the, what we, the second goal was to provide administrators with cultural proficiency professional development during the 16-17 school year and plan for professional development for teachers during the 17-18 school year. Um, we began with workshops uh, or learning, learning times for us, learning sessions on, on cultural awareness we began last summer, all the administrators in the district, and I gave you the three dates that we have met on this. But what we, um, it was facilitated by two administrators who had had a considerable experience in outside of our district in leading this kind of work. And what we came to, dis came to the conclusion is that I think we reached a point where it would be helpful to have an outside facilitator. And we do have someone, we have six days scheduled this summer, two of which are required, day, well, everybody's gonna have four days, but you get to pick two, two, two of the units, two days um, that are two days back to back, and then there's a, um, a beginning and ending session. So that is happening. As far as planning for cultural awareness, th this is, um, happening as part of actually the earlier goal as we look at the action plans for next year. 
All right. I, I, have to, I have to say I, I'm, I'm glad that you're using, I, I was actually surprised that we hadn't gone to an outside person right away, mm -hmm. and I'm really um, heartened that, um, about this development. I think this is, a, I, I've met this person, he's fabulous. He is fabulous. And, um, and I, th I think it's gonna be a, a really interesting set, set of sessions. I think so too, and, we, and um, I have been working with uh, Dr. Hoyt in laying out, we're still not completely done, but we have a good plan for these these six days, actually it's four days. Everybody has four days. All right. So, um, actually, I'm gonna, if you don't mind, you can talk to sure. this. Do you yeah. mind? But anyway, this is uh, to provide ongoing and regular professional development in technology <coughs> to support teachers in using technology to enhance teaching and learning. And um, you know, we continued the Tech University last summer, but I think one of the things that um, we learned and we that sometimes the most effective professional development is when you embed it, and it's not just necessarily a, a class or a demonstration, and when people can come in and help coach or give you some pointers, and I think that, um, that that's the work that you've been doing with our two um, at, at instructional specialists. Right. Um, Susan Bisson at the elementary schools and Joanna Bradley at the middle school have um, go in and work with teachers in the classroom. Um, you go to a class, you learn something. If you don't put it to work right away, you forget it. Um, so they go in and work with people in the classroom. Um, and they are responsible for all of that training, including um, they've been heavily involved with the training for MCAS Next Generation, for the teachers who are having kids take it for the first time online, and um, doing infrastructure tests across the district so that teachers can feel comfortable that when they get in there, the network is going to support them. Um, and the other thing that I um, had forgotten is that um, Susan also runs uh, one Thursday Every other, every other Thursday during the month, a tech and practice group. So groups of teachers get together, they trade um, uh, what's going well, what's not going well, and then Susan has a website where she posts all the information so teachers across the district can share in that information. Great. There are increasing number of videos, too, yes. that we have been, um, and I'll probably add that in there, the videos where it's the how-tos, and sometimes those are, easier for people to access if they're home and they don't have the person around. Um, so going on here, um, the, diver the increase of diversity of the APS staff this year, staffing levels to better reflect the diversity of our students. I'm, I'm not sure that this goal will ever go away. It's uh, something that we have been committing to do. We've worked toward it. and. Um, it, you've had a report about the success or la uh, minimal success we've had this year um, from last year, but we remained committed to the work. We have the, the coffee, by the way, you're most invited to come. It's April 26th, where we will have, um, we invite, personally invite applicants from diverse backgrounds and um, to this coffee if they, to, to meet with administrators and possible openings. So, Mr. Spiegel's been at a job fair. This has already started and um, will be, has brought and will bring back more resumes that we will uh, reach out to people. I'm going to make a mm -hmm. comment. So when community members come to me um, with the concern that we, we don't have as much diversity as we would like, one of the things I say to them is that one of the most effective things is personal connections. Mm -hmm. you know, that, that people in the community who know other people with diverse backgrounds should be reaching out, telling them what a fabulous place Arlington is. You know, and that, that can often be, that kind of personal connections can often be an incredibly effective way to get um, people that we really want. Um, so, I, as I encourage that it doesn't, we don't have to put all the burden on you. It's a team effort. We should all be involved in this process. And, and we have been trying to do more networking, but I, I appreciate that comment because, you know, there's a lot of people in the community who have connections? Who, who know connections? People. Exactly. And, we need um, to spread the word. What we, what we perhaps should do, um, we put our openings on School Spring, and most people who, who might want to know if there's an opening would not look on School Spring. So, we might want to be think we we put them on our website as well, 
So maybe that's something that you know people are wondering. They see that we're looking for oh, a like middle you, yeah. a middle school English teacher, perhaps they might know of someone yeah. and refer them to us. So uh, that that would be very helpful. All right. So that was goal two, which is again uh, is focusing on the. Um, the program, which is focusing on professional development and just uh, uh, our staff support. So goal three of the vision of the Arlington Public Schools is to create the resources, infrastructure, and educational environment that will offer cost-effective education, that maximizes the impact of taxpayer dollars, and utilizes best practices, academic research, and rigorous self-evaluation to provide students and staff the resources, materials, and infrastructure required for optimum teaching and learning in a safe and healthy environment. And certainly the safe and healthy environment, one of the, one of the things that we're doing is working on our buildings, for sure. And uh, I think that this year you've heard updates on the building projects every single meeting, um, but it doesn't you know, I, I don't think it's, I think the community knows that we probably have more building projects going on than any of our neighbors mm -hmm. in a wide area. We have five building projects going on, or hopefully it's going to be five. Of, we'll, we'll see after town meeting for Hardy, but well, we, we certainly have four yeah. active projects going on right now. Mm -hmm. And um, the intent in all of these is to create an environment for both students and staff that are great learning environments and are very safe, safe environments. So um, the technology plan is a little right up here. We, we, there, this is something that uh, Dr. Chesson has been working on and the draft, every year we revise it. We've had a technology plan. The technology plan is on the website, but it's not a, it is a dynamic plan and it changes. And in order for it to change, you have to reach out to all the different stakeholders that are involved, and this is the process that the plan is in right now. Um, we already mentioned what one of the reach outs was, was to the Stratton educators as to what their device preference is, going, is, and now it's been decided. And now the same process is going to happen with the sixth grade teachers, uh, which helps shape the plan in terms of you know, when we first started with this technology plan, we were in a different place than we are now in terms of understanding what, what would be the most effective tool in the classroom. So that is, it's just changing. And um, I don't know if you want to add anything else to that. No, just that the level of um, expertise in the teaching community has really increased. And so I feel much more um, comfortable having people come to the table and, you know, they're dealing from a place of experience as opposed to a place of, you know, I'm, I'm fearful of this. This is the only thing I know. Um, and so we want to give people as much opportunity as possible to say, you know, it doesn't, whether it's an iPad or a Chromebook, it doesn't really, I mean, there's, there's a cost difference. But in terms of um, what, which device they feel, as long as they can create an argument that, um, you know, matches and makes reasonable, we, we want to support teachers and provide them with the kind of device that they feel that they would most best use in the classroom. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, so one of our goals was to complete all the documentation for Module 1 that's been done. I gave you the, we, we keep a, um, all, a list of all the documentation on the website. I will tell you that the, there, is a, there are two committees, um, subcommittees right now, actually three, um, on the building committee for the high school. And one is a communication subcommittee, and it's meeting on Monday to look at our communication plan. Well, I, we have all this documentation there. We need something that's going to be a little bit more engaging. And we need a, we need a communication plan out as to what's happening. And that we'll be beginning the work on that and keep you informed. But right now, all the documents that were submitted in Module 1 are, have been released onto the website. And anybody can read it. And uh, on the left-hand side of our website, there's on the quick links, there's a building there's the facilities, and if you go into that, it immediately go to, uh, you know, two, four other um, uh, areas in which you can then go to Gibbs and see all that's there, or the high school and see all that's there. The 
so we're moving into um, operations. Uh, goal four, which is about operations, communication, and stakeholder engagement in, the, in our schools. So one of the, the goals I think we all shared was to create a dashboard. There was a lot of collaboration with the Community Relations Subcommittee to create a, uh, a dashboard that was going to be able to provide a lot of quick information for people <coughs> wanting to know more about the Arlington Public Schools. It's, it's not something that, again, is st static. It's going to change. We're going to increase um, some areas of it. Um, we're going to certainly have to update things annually, but I think it's a good way to begin. I, in fact, even in the, the budget report we're going to give to town meeting, we're putting in a lot of graphics, in com graphics, for example, about our comparison to the town, uh, the town manager 12. And I think that that information is very helpful to put where we are in perspective. And I will say, <coughs> as a sneak preview, <laughs> that we do really well. I mean, for the money that we have per, as a per pupil, we, we, the town should be very proud of the, the school system they have in terms of its performance. And a lot of that goes to the teachers and the students in our district. <coughs> okay. Um, so in, another goal this year was to implement upgrades to the district's financial software. Well, the and provide professional development for all users. At this point, it's really even all people, financial, the, the financial software of the school is the financial software of the town. And uh, the town undertook a major upgrade. We went from 9.4 to 11.2. And that normally is something you would have done over many years, and we've done it in a year. And it's required a, a lot of meetings, a lot of time. My hat's off to Patty Brennan for what leading this. Uh, in the school department, this affects the business office, payroll, and HR. And all the people that are involved there have been involved in meetings and professional development at least once a month since this project began, and it's still ongoing. Um, continue to engage parents and stakeholders in the as the district addresses enrollment and facility needs. Um, tonight you heard from Vision 20 and the work we're doing. It, while it's not directly to enrollment in facilities, it is an outreach to the community to, to have them understand what we're doing as a school system. Um, but in terms of the, the more narrow enrollment and facility needs, we had a, um, we, we have a visioning of Gibbs Parent Night in the fall which was similar to the one we did with the teachers at Audison. And those, the outcome of those meetings really did lead to the principles that have guided the, the, the really guided the development of the Gibbs plan. And we're gonna go through the same process with the high school because you have to have principles that you build upon as you make a lot of decisions. And in fact, I can tell you for a fact that when decisions have come up in a lot of Gibbs planning meetings, sometimes go back to those principles and say, you know, that was that was an important priority. So we've, you know, in, in terms of the facility of the high school, and the, and I, I would say even probably more for the high school than Gibbs, but we we partnered with Vision 2020 to show the the movie Most Likely to Succeed in November, and there was a follow up discussion in the community in December. Um, we had, we had, I had a coffee in the fall, and I'm hoping to have one in the spring. Um, and, you know, what comes up is questions about enrollment, questions about facilities, and questions about social emotional. It, it's, a, it's sort of a wide ranging conversation. And then in terms of advisory, there's a Gibbs Advisory Committee that consisting of teachers and parents. Um, and this committee, has met with the architects to review the, vi the interior visuals of the school and gave a lot of feedback and we're gonna meet again very soon. I don't know, it might take two meetings, it might take three, we'll, we'll see how many meetings it'll take to, to, to deal with this. But those are examples of the kind of outreach we've done this year so far. Mr. Hainer. Just for my own clarification, this was a Summary of the district goals, am I correct? Correct. So, 
Do we have a date? But, there, but that's embedded in this. What's embedded in this? My, uh, my two goals. So is this our meeting for the mid, is, do you see this as a, the meeting for the midterm on your goals? This is the update, okay. yes. Okay, thank you. So uh, any other questions, comments? So, yeah, Dr. Allison, I This is more to my fellow committee members. Um, and just looking at goal two, this is for thinking for the future. Mm -hmm. Looking at goal two, so the way we phrase the goals, what we don't know is if what we did, was it enough? You know, we we're told about what we did, but we don't know, was it enough? Did it work? Did it achieve the results that we were trying to get? We're not, and I'd just like to see us pushing towards getting that next level, not just that we're doing things. It's, I'm not questioning that you're doing things and they're effective. I'm saying I want to be able to tell people why we know that. Right. Do, um, that's just a message. When we do professional development, if you're talking about goal two, professional development, we solicit feedback after every... But what you're wondering is, for example, was the professional development for the math rollout effective? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. And how do you measure whether it's effective? Well, one way you're going to know whether it's effective is how our students are going to continue to perform, both for math and science. So there's an, ex there's an right. external um, assessment that's going to go on there. But I, I think there's other measures of it, and certainly whether teachers feel that they understand the curriculum and feel comfortable teaching the mm -hmm. curriculum. And that's the kind of information we try to gather both through the PD uh, feedback, as also we try to get it through coaches Mm -hmm. um, as to what's happening because they're very close to the situation. So there's multiple there's sort of qualitative and quantitative ways that we, mm -hmm. we will get to it. Uh, as far as measuring the rollout right now, I think that our feedback, I know our feedback from all of our PD on this has been very positive. Specifically in the math and the rollout of the new math curriculum, K-1, mm -hmm. um, we actually uh, did a number of PD not only on Tuesday but also um, had release time during the school day for the K teachers and the one teachers in groups of two, like two schools, um, to get together and get additional PD and planning. <laughs> and that ha the feedback from that has been so positive in terms of this is the first time when I've had a new curriculum, I felt like totally prepared to go into the classroom. I really feel like I, the, the, po the feedback was so positive that even though the principals and elementary principals initially said, no more PD during the day, I can't cover those classes or I'm having trouble covering those classes, you know how much trouble we have getting subs, that when the math director went to them and said, I'd really like to continue to do this for grades two and three, they all said, you know what, it's one of the most effective PDs we've ever had, let's, put, let's do it again next year. So that's the kind of feedback, but we can certainly write that up and present that. To yeah, you next I'm time. just thinking it helps us sure. when we're trying to allow for money yeah. or yeah, mm -hmm. yeah absolutely yeah. Right. So that's a good that, that's a good <coughs> point and when I give you a final wrap up of it I'll try to include more of that of, of, yeah. of how what kind of feedback we had the success yeah of this. I mean both both in the moment after it and then three months later oh you know I'm realizing now I never learned about this part or sure. something you know so yeah. that we keep yeah. improving um, one, the one of the other things and, and I expect to do that again this year is that we um a lot of times go around and do focus group interviews um, with different grades. And so K and one will be my focus for this year. I always actually meet with K um, mm -hmm. steering committee once a month, but also to go around to K and one teachers and ask them at the end of the school year, what worked for you, what didn't work for you in terms mm -hmm. of professional mm -hmm. development. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So my memory last year is that we took this document and we sent it to CIAA and they might do nothing with it, but just to do the final review and sort of mm -hmm. see if there's anything else. Mm -hmm. That was what we did last year. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I suggest that we send it to them this year, but again, again, they might just say, done, nothing needed, but just to do a final review to see if there's anything else we'd like reported out in the next, you know, mm -hmm. in this midterm cycle. Sound my suggestion. Um, anything else? Are there any other comments, questions? No? OK. Um, so uh, 
Next item is the consent agenda. Um, all, and we are eh, not as early as before. Okay. All items listed with an asterisk are considered to be routine and will be enacted in one motion. There will be no separate discussion of these items unless a member of the committee so requests, in which event the item will be considered in its normal sequence. Approval of warrant. Approval of warrant number 17151. Total warrant amount $647,540. Um, Seven dollars and twenty-one cents, dated three sixteen two thousand seventeen. Approval of minutes. Approval of school committee regular minutes meeting Thursday, March sixteenth, two thousand and seventeen. Approval of trip. Arlington High School performance of arts trip to Italy and Switzerland, February two thousand and eighteen. Um, I think there's one more. Uh, vote to approve school committee organizational meeting Thursday, April thirteenth, two thousand and seventeen, at six fifteen. So moved. Okay. Second. Mm all right, seconded by Mr. Schlickman. Um, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Okay. That's all it's <coughs> unanimous. Um, subcommittee reports. Uh, budget. Dr. Alice Nampi. We passed the budget last time. <laughs> <laughs> Report. Okay. Uh, community relations. Ms. Starks. Um, I want to start by apologizing to everybody for um, the fact that I thought that my emails were all being forwarded, and I have not gotten any official school committee emails for two months. So I just found that out. I think I fixed it, but that's why I have not been showing up or responding to anybody because whatever I did didn't work. So I apologize. I think I fixed it. Um, so sorry I didn't make so it this, this evening. This is actually why. I didn't make it to Monday's meeting. I haven't responded to you. I'm like, shit. Sorry. I did not know that I thought I'd set it up correctly. I thought it was all forwarding, and I wasn't getting that mail. Mm -hmm. So that's why it's not like I've dropped off the earth. Um, so this weekend, uh, Jennifer and Paul are going to be doing the school committee chat from 11 to 12. Um, other than that, community relations uh, has not had a meeting since February 27th, and uh, obviously we won't have another one until after the election, but set one up as soon as we... Yeah. Um, I think if there's a need, we can still have meetings, you know, before the next, you know, we need restructuring. To, we, we need to organize first. Before the next restructuring, if there is a need. Yeah. I'm just saying it seems like there yeah. could still be a need. I don't think there's anything meeting, on fire. May so. not be, yeah, yeah, may not be a need. Yeah. I'm just so saying. I, we'll probably just wait till yeah. after that. But that's it. Okay. Uh, District <coughs> Accountability Curriculum Instruction Assessment. We celebrate. Uh, first of all, as chair of the subcommittee, I want to thank the uh, school committee chair for her service this year in leading us through a good year for the school committee. Um, we are done for the year. We are dissolving with everything else uh, on April 1st, <laughs> and we look forward to reconstituting uh, in, in, in a new year. All right. All right. Um, facilities, Mr. Thurman. I'll second Mr. Schlickman's report and thank you for your <laughs> leadership. I think it's a good time to do that because I think we're wrapping up the year. So thank you very much for your service. Oh, well. <laughs> With all the mistakes there. Um, I finally got it, actually. <laughs> uh, school Enrollment Task Force. Anything uh, else? We haven't met. We have met. skipping policy. I do. Sorry. Thank you. I have to say, by the end of the night, my contacts yeah. are really, like, I know. Fuzzy, fuzzy, and that's why I'm doing it. I'm so sorry about no that. Problem. Policies. And I was going to say you had a perfect night tonight, yeah, yeah. but I won't say it now. <laughs> no, no, I didn't. No, thank you. I'd also like to thank the members of the policy committee, Kirsty and Paul, for their work and their endurance for putting up with me for a whole year. All right. Nothing else at this time. Okay. Legal service review. Nothing at this time. Arlington High School Building Committee. We meet on Tuesday. Right in here and at... 6 p.m. 6 p.m. Okay. Yeah, and, and also the meeting on Monday is at 6.30. It's actually the communications subcommittee. Right. So oh, okay. that's, that's oh, the meeting oh, that you oh, Communications subcommittee <laughs> of the high school building. Yes. Right, great. So that's, public that's, meeting. That's, People can oh, go. Yeah, yeah. everything's public. Yeah, yep. uh, all public meetings. Okay. Um, Gibbs committee. It has not met. Okay. Since Warrant committee. the last time it met. Everyone got paid. Okay. Any leads on reports? Mr. Hainer. We've got a couple. Uh, Permanent Sound Building Committee will be meeting in this room next Tuesday right after the uh, uh, Arlington High School Building Committee, uh, committee meeting at 7.30. And that's a great place. Dr. Bodie answered the questions on money, but the architects and everybody show up at that meeting, and they'll tell you the nuts and bolts of uh, where the buildings are as well. <laughs> where the buildings are? <laughs> as far as progress. <laughs> yeah. They may, 
they'll also tell you where they look at. I'd also like to share, um, there was a meeting last uh, Wednesday in Boston at, on March 22nd, uh, Bridging Two Communities, a METCO initiative, uh, a planning group was uh, established and it was well attended uh, by the people that signed up from that meeting we had earlier. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're beginning. All right. Thank you. Announcements. Yes, Mr. Hainer. Uh, Medco on the Hill was rescheduled after uh, that last snowstorm. It, they, people will gather at the African American Museum at uh, 9 a.m. Meeting House. At the Meeting House, thank you. On Joy Street. On a April 4th. Uh, there's something going on at the State House preventing the, the normal part. The second part is two part. Watertown Savings Bank has a banner out in front congratulating our hockey team. This, so I wanted to share that. And Watertown Savings Bank have provided a $500 grant supporting the Bridging Two Communities. So I want to thank them publicly uh, for supporting this group. Great. I want to make an announcement that the play, um, Arlington High School is putting on a play um, this Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, uh, 7.30 on Friday and Saturday, and 3 o'clock on Sunday. They are performing, um, what's it? Crazy, for, crazy, you. crazy for, for You. Crazy For You. Crazy For You. Gershwin's Crazy For You is, I think, Gershwin's last play. It's still, yeah, Crazy For You. Um, and there's an art. And, oh, and there's an art exhibit, right? Yes. What's and that is that timing? Um, it'll be going for another week or so, but it's down in the teachers. Okay, uh, so it's calf. Okay, great. Any other announcements? Oh yeah, one other thing. Uh, we had a good time uh, participating in the uh, oh trivia bee. trivia bee <laughs> uh, last Sunday, uh, and yes, uh, crazy for you was one of the trivia answers. Um, uh, we did not. Uh, we didn't get that one. I mean, the, the, <laughs> oh. just being modest. I, I, I think that was one of our something. questions. Oh yes. Did we win? Uh, we we won <laughs> best team name. Best team name. What was yeah. our team name? Name? Which Most was Mr. Clever, Mr. Schlitzman's uh, genius. And you dig it. And you dig it. Uh, we were in uh, Jennifer's wonderful costumes of construction, yellow oh, art ads. So under construction. And, That's awesome. Uh, yeah, the, the best costume went to uh, basically Joe Curro uh, and the school committee alumni team. Yeah, they just um, like Snoopy. I mean, they, yeah, he, they really pulled yeah, it out. He, he, with, they had makeup on. I mean, oh, yeah, makeup. Yeah, <laughs> they had a lot. Yeah, we, yeah. we weren't doing makeup. Yeah. But it was a great time, and uh, they had the kids playing the first round. Yeah. And the Stratton team, which won, got Every, oh, Dallin. Dallin. Oh, Dallin, Dallin rather. Dallin, Dallin, Dallin team, team that yeah. won. <laughs> that side of the town. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That was the kid team. No, no. The Dallin no, fifth graders won. Oh, no, no. The Stratton team for the adults. Yes. Oh, yes. The Stratton team for the adults. The Stratton team for the adults. Yes, you're right. I'm sorry, right. The Dallin team. Got every team. question yes. right. Mm -hmm. Which is unbelievably amazing. Yep. Um, Don't they win every year? No. No, I mean, no, no. no I it, moves, it moves around. And their team was also a building based thing. They were wearing little hats of, yeah. the, of the Stratton building. The modulars. The modulars. The modulars. Oh, the modulars. The modulars. Yeah, the modulars, yes. And they're modulars. <laughs> yes. Uh, it's a great event, and uh, I thank my two colleagues for playing with, with me, and, uh, and we'll play again next year. Uh, so another announcement, this Saturday there is an election, yes. a town Shocking. election happening. Uh, the major races are not contested, however, 12 of the 21 precincts have contested races, and some of them incredibly contested. So, mm -hmm. um, so I encourage everyone to vote, no matter what. But, um, but especially uh, find out who the town meeting members running in your precinct are, and talk to your neighbors, and 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 talk to the people running, and uh, make a decision. Yeah, Mr. And Rainer. We have the wonderful opportunity now. All the votes in the past two years have been recorded, so you can go to the town website and mm -hmm. see where how people have voted right. and become a more informed. Yeah, oh, and vote. also whether that particular town meeting member has been going to the meetings because yes. we do have some, well. some people who don't show up as often. Yeah, yeah. And so it's good to know that. Um, other announcements? Future agenda items. Mr. Hayner. I would like the committee to decide a definite procedure of what items we will accept or delay that is submitted to us late. I'm not talking about emergency items. I want that clear, that they always get a priority. Example tonight, and yeah. for whatever reason, we received two items as late as an hour prior to the meeting. And I'm old, I may be the only one, but I, I need some time to digest and, and give each item its due. I think we were doing well before, but I think we did slip. We, we yeah. keep slip, we've it done slipped, it, and it we slipped. slipped. For sure. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. 
Yeah. Um, other future agenda items? Um, I, I want to throw out a couple. Um, it sounds like we need, um, we, we're going to see the technology plan um, coming up pretty soon. Right, the new technology plan is going to be a future agenda item for school committee. Um, yeah, great I time think you're, you're looking at uh, the next meet. I have two meetings, and then it depends on whether the um, meeting with the sixth grade for Gibbs mm -hmm. um, comes to a conclusion or we have to come back to the table again. So until that's resolved, we, we really can't put together the a final technology plan. plan. Yes. Okay, I, I'm sorry. I thought it was April no matter what. So no, said. April, I'm <laughs> going to sit down with them. But Got it. because okay. it's Gibbs is a year yep. out, I they understand. don't have to, I don't want to make them decide like that. Got you know? it. Got to understand. Um, and the other thing, which also involves Dr. Chesson, is um, some update about how the new MCAS are going and what has changed. And We can certainly yeah. tell you that in great clarity the next meeting because right. we start testing on Monday. Great. Yes, yeah, so that would be helpful for the committee, I think. Okay. Anything else? Okay. Um, so, executive session, we're going to move to executive session. Uh, to conduct strategy sessions in pre preparation for negotiation with union and or non-union personnel or contract negotiations with union and or non-union in which held in an open meeting may have a detrimental effect. To conduct strategy with respect to collective bargaining or litigation in which if held in an open meeting may have a detrimental effect. Collective bargaining may also be conducted. To discuss open meeting law complaint, negotiations update, Approval of tact traffic supervisors memorandum of agreement. Nope. Vote to approve the following executive session minutes, March 16th, 2017. Okay. So uh, move. We're going to do Second. roll call to go into executive session, right? Are we going to come out? We're not coming out. That's why I understand. We, yeah. Well, we are going to come out, but we're not going to come out and vote. <laughs> we don't need to come out and vote. We, we are, are leaving executive, we, we session. executive session. We were going to adjourn executive <laughs> session. Okay. Call roll. Yes. Hi. Yes. 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 Okay. We are in executive session. Wagon. <laughs>